Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, ma'am. So that's why you're on mute, sir. Santosh, bhai. Good morning, Are you there? Good morning, sir. Ma'am, I'm here. Abhaya, thoda recording on rakhiega. Aao, to on ho gaya. Ha, dekhi. Aur photos kahan rakh rahe hain? देवलीना को छोड़ के और कोई भी दो तीन जन रखो हाँ मनीषा यू कैन डू ऑल द थिंग्स टूगेदर लेट्स निकधा एंड देवलीना हैंडल द स्नैप्स पार्टिसिपेंट्स ने गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन गुड मॉर्निंग फ्रांसिस सर मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग चैलेंजिंग Kushi, are you there? Yes. Kushi, uh, please keep some snaps also. Devlina ma'am and Sigha ma'am are keeping. You also keep some. Let's have as maximum as possible. Then we can uh, select those which will be posted. Okay. okay. Good morning, yes, Professor Siddharth. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Doctor Priyanka here. Hi. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, Priyanka ma'am. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Ma'am, ma you are not visible. Oh, just a second. Good, good morning. morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, all. Good morning, Doctor Francis. Good morning, Doctor. Good to see you. Came here, sir. How is everything there, yeah, sir? Doctor Francis, sir. Oh yes, yes. How how is everything here? Ah, we are very good, very good. It's uh, it's late here, so where I am, it's uh, about uh, ten thirty p.m. in the evening. So <laughs> different uh, time. So, but all very good. We're at the end of our semester, so the U.S. Uh, semester generally. Finishes in the spring, and so we're in exams, exam period. My students take their exam next week, criminal law exam, and then uh, then I'll grade <laughs> 110 exams. So, it'll be good. Same here. Um, our uh, postgraduate students are also going to take examination tomorrow. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and the LLB students uh, after 15 days they'll be uh, taking the examinations. Okay. Very good.
Siddharth. Yes, ma'am. Please give Sir a call. Action. Good morning, sir. Uh, audible? Uh, good morning, sir. You are audible, sir. Good morning, sir. Yeah, am I audible? Yes, sir. sir. Yes, sir. You are audible, sir. Ma'am, you are on mute, ma'am. Good morning, sir. You are audible. Sir, cannot hear anything, I think. Hello. Hello. Ha, huh. hello, sir. Yeah, I'm not going to come. I get it muted somewhere. I'm not going to listen. Santosh Bhai, please. Ek dekhi but I'm not able to listen to you guys. Okay. Okay. Now, no. Uh, sound, uh, you speak. Sir, good morning, sir. Yeah. Sir, good morning, sir. Okay, now. 
Am I audible? No, you can yes, hear. Sir. Yes, sir. We can hear you. You are audible, sir. You are audible, sir. You are audible, sir. Sir, now you can hear us or not? Good morning, sir. Santo, sir. Wow. Can speak now. Let let me listen. Can you can you speak on the mic? Can you speak on the mic? Am I listening? I'm audible. Yes. Okay. Hello. Okay. Okay. Good morning, sir. So, Good sir, morning. can we start? Hmm. Yeah, something I got it. Okay. So, so maybe morning. start. Good morning, sir. You should start. Thank you. Anisha, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning, all of you. Good morning, one and all present here. I, Manisha Mishra, on behalf of Kids School of Law, welcome you all to, this, to the second international webinar on law, brain, and mind sciences organized by Center for Criminology, Victimology, and Police Sciences. Uh, before we start with the webinar, I would request all of you to please click on the feedback form which shall be uh, sent on, uh, which has been uh, mentioned in the chat box. And uh, if you want to avail uh, the uh, uh, certificates, clicking on the feedback form shall help. And the question answer session uh, shall be proceeding after the conclusion of the first uh, speaker's uh, discussions and deliberation. And uh, the question answers shall be addressed once your questions have been jotted down in the chat box. Uh, bef uh, so I would like now like to request Professor uh, Mr. Siddharth Shekhar Das, Assistant Professor, Kids School of Law, and Faculty Convener of the program, to introduce us to the topic of the webinar. Sir, please. Hello, uh, dear scholars, students, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. The title of our webinar, Law, Brain, and Mind Senses, is thought provoking. The lectures in this webinar shall explore on the intersection of law, neuroscience, and psychology. This new and emerging domain of knowledge tradition is conveniently termed as neurolaw. Strange though it may sound, and also to a traditionalist in legal discipline, it may be less curious. However, the intersection of normative science, neuroscience, and psychology has a promising beginning. It begins with the analysis of facts, situation, events from the perspective of neuroscience and psychology that aspires to help evidential, substantive, and procedural norms. Scientific temper with judicial, uh, jurisprudential analysis is necessary and inevitable. Neurolaw, the interdisciplinary studies of neuroscience and law, establishes a relationship of brain with law. The cognitive neuroscience finds more relevance in jurisprudence to expand its scope. The study of neuro law asks more comprehensive and accurate approach to the legal phenomena, considering the importance of the brain that are associated with the formulation of reasoning and discerning morality by an accused person. Neuro law tries to negotiate seemingly simple and ordinary, yet more perplex values that confronts law at every works of application like morality and justice. It approaches these values with scientific temper and evaluation. Neurolaw also tries to show the existence of mens rea, the mental element for the commission of offense of an offender, which is sine qua non for its conviction in the court of law. Thus, the scientific approach to the mens rea shall make justice delivery system fairer. Neurolaw aspires to help law to answer the age old question with scientific evolution, for example, whether the witness is telling a lie, whether the accused had an intention or knowledge for the offense, whether the accused was morally culpable, can justice be utilitarian? Our first speaker, Dr. Sen, graduate from Harvard University, shall elaborately deal on this aspect. I strongly believe 
that his lecture shall enthuse and generate interest among young students and scholars to think about law from a new perspective and shall carry out research and shall contribute to the body of knowledge in neuroscience, law, psychology to solve human problems that comes in the shape of injustice. Neuroscience shall also help common man to realize his constitutional values. One of the popular constitutional values that comes to my mind is the right of silence. Selvi versus Karnataka by the Supreme Court, which allowed brain mapping only with consent and not for evidential purpose, surcharged the debate more in Indian criminal jurisprudence. However, much water have thrown since Selvi judgment and new scientific researchers are shaping and reshaping the quantile of jurisprudence every day. Our second speaker from India, Dr. Priyanka, has been working in this field of brain mapping for a decade and we shall be immensely benefited from her experience participating in her lecture. Before I rest, may I share with you some sample titles of research and papers to show the gamut of law, brain, and mind sciences. The title of the research papers are Neuroscience and Free Will, Neuroscience and Law 2.0, Choice, Free Will, Consciousness, and Mind in Humans and Computers, a current overview of consumer neuroscience, brain computer interfaces and protection of fundamental rights of the vulnerable persons, the effect of pre-event instruction on eyewitness identification. Do traditional lineups undermine the capacity of eyewitnesses memory to rule out innocent suspect, evaluating the claim that high confidence implies high accuracy in eyewitness identification. Internet of Things Forensic Identification and Classification of Evidence in Criminal Investigation. Can computer brain interface help us make better decision? The volitional brain towards a neuro sense of free will. Rewiring juvenile justice, intersection of developmental neuroscience and legal policy. A social neuroscience perspective on adolescent risk taking. From brain to the field, application of social neuroscience to economics, health, and law. Neuro prediction and artificial intelligence in forensic psychiatry and criminal justice, a neuro law perspective. What is neuromarketing? The functional MRI test of intention and unintentional social norms, damage to the prefrontal cortex increases utility and moral judgment. And lastly, using cognitive neuroscience to predict future dangerous, dangerousness. These are some of the titles of the research papers in the field of law, brand, and mind sciences. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I would now request Dr. Arpita Mitra, Associate Professor, Kids School of Law and Coordinator of CCVPS to kindly share her welcome address. Thank you, Manisha. I, Dr. Arpita Mitra, Associate Professor, School of Law, Coordinator, Center for Criminology, Victimology and Police Science, is extending a warm welcome to the second international webinar of Center of Criminology, Victimology, and Police Science on Law, Brain, and Mind Sciences. With the blessings of the Almighty and the best wishes and motivation of our founder, Professor Achutananda Samanta, Vice Chancellor, Professor Rushikesh Mohanty, Pro-Vice Chancellor, Professor Sasmita Samanta, Registrar, uh, Dr. Gyanaranjan Mohanty, our Director, SOL, Professor Bhavani Prasad Panda, we have been successful in organizing the second international webinar within a span of two months. We are delighted and honored to have our resource persons, Professor Francis X. Shen and Dr. Priyanka Kakar to grace the occasion. I welcome you, sir and ma'am. I also welcome the participants for registering with such enthusiasm. We have about 300 registrations done. I hope they will all join soon. 
I hope this webinar will be successful in fulfilling our expectations in this area, which is still awaiting much more research and arouse meaningful discourse. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. I would now request Honorable Director Sir, Professor Dr. Bhavani Prasad Panda, who is the chairperson of CCVPS, to kindly address the gathering with the inaugural address. Thank you, sir. Sir, please. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Manisha. Uh, it's so nice of you and your team from the Center for Technology, Technology and Policy Science, CCPBS, for organizing this particular second international webinar. A webinar. The topic is very interesting, lab, brain, and mind sciences. So I must congratulate, first of all, for having chosen this particular thing and uh, advancing for this particular program as scheduled. And I'm sure that this particular program is going to have a lot of uh, uh, brainstorming which has something to do with brain and uh, even something to do with mind that is again responsibility. And I'm sure the program is going to come wonderfully well. I must welcome Professor Francis San and uh, Priyanka Kaka and our colleagues and uh, eminently and more uh, prominently, Professor uh, Siddharth Sekhar Das, uh, Professor Arpita Mitra, uh, our student Smriti Avilasa, and uh, of course, the moderator Manisha Misra, and Shushpita Misra student, and Devolina, I welcome you all and thank you for being this particular wonderful program. Once again, the topic uh, reminds me many things. Uh, let me tell you, as far as criminalized concerns, uh, whenever you speak of mind and uh, uh, with respect to criminal law, normally I get attracted to mentia. Act as non facetrium and And uh, no mind, no act can be found. In other words, the act is serious, the guilty act should be exactly the same what has been thought over in the mind and that should be translated. If this is not matching, now in other words, mind points out something else act point of something else, then there is a gap. So first of all, for a long time we have been looking, what is the mentia? Therefore we want to fix the responsibility. It's usual when a small accident takes place in Indian context, we get into this uh, first question, whose fault it is? Fault liability. When you speak of fault, probably you are Robbing something into the brain and the minds. Fault. Where from the fault comes out? Fault is associated with responsibility. Fault is associated with liability. Fault is associated with the mind. Responsibility. So this particular whose fault? And uh, thereafter, uh, in Indian context, very peculiarly, the mind is to be taken. Uh, the people who are in affluent class, like who is somebody driving a car, his mind is more fertile. Somebody driving a cycle. Riding a cycle, his mind is not over time. So make this particular person who is in a car, he should be responsible. At the time, probably you are not looking really into the mind, but you are looking to the affluence. This character can pay the money. The character was traveling in a cycle, though it may be his fault. Okay, he can still afford, this man can afford, why he will not pay? The question is, uh, it, it gets very interesting how the social psych changes from time to time and place to place. And uh, mind has something to do with maturity and understanding. If the understanding is very clear, the civic sense is very clear. If the civic sense is clear, the criminal law probably will uh, relegate itself to a, a small place. If the mind and education not very clear, will have lot many criminals. In other words, uh, the type of criminals will be changed. In other words, we always said 
every society deserves the criminal it has if somebody is a criminal or his behavior is criminal we always relate to the mind of the society and mind of a individual mind of the society probably this is something we need to understand in other words if you look into the mob culture individually everybody is wonderful but suddenly they are in a mob they behave differently and ultimately nobody can control the particular brain and it becomes a very less is a fair start of a fate and who is speaking what that is where exactly in uh, indian penal code we look into what is called as uh, unlawful assembly common object in the sense the mob of the minds the mob's mind or the mind of the mob and the mob the mob the mind of the individual mind of the individual is very interesting i am not going to the crime now let's for a moment i i'll i will not discuss about the crime in criminal law but as an individual as a child i grew up into an area in a process what is called adolescence then i grew up into adult and i don't become an adult immediately i from the childhood there is some particular age the people they call very popularly teenage and we call them adolescents and from the adolescents you go into young adult from young adult to adult from there we capture we become elderly this is a peculiar phase everybody in the life has to face one has to live a complete life cycle so in this particular phase how the mind works probably this is where you are going to discuss about the psychology aspect of it but i'll tell you there is a lot of gap a man goes through one looks back to his own life or her life as a child i have been put into so many constraints like rosso said man is born free but is born with chains lot of do's and don'ts comes out from nobody other than the parents they say you should do this thing you should touch this thing you should speak like this you shouldn't be here you shouldn't be there you should do that you should do that and also the restrictions then auto- automatically a rebellion child like me will start experimenting why my parents are asking to stop i am going to do the same thing what they want to stop and i'm all right if you don't restrict me i'll be free to think whether i'll do or not do if you restrict me then i said i must do and uh, i don't know how you want to fix the responsibility on me because i rebelled rebel for what do i have a right to rebel this is the question now next coming down as i grew to adult sense my biology my chemistry they behave differently and i am not in control of those things and even i tell you probably my body is much more active than the mind or my mind is much more active than the body i don't think my mind is more active than my body my body speaks its own passion my body speaks its own anger my body speaks its own temper somewhere i am disconnect from the mind i am not exactly synchronizing with the mind you call it adolescent stage and adolescent stage is a very peculiar stage everybody goes through it but of late neither in psychology nor in sociology nor in criminal law it is being given the due space lot of literature is available best of the literature in the whole of the world has come out from the adolescent minds best of the inventions have taken from the adolescent minds and i think the adolescent phase is the best phase but unfortunately adolescent phase has been branded and branded because they are not going to listen to whatever you want to say they will be doing everything on their own probably they are the people who enjoy the liberty in the real sense and nobody else but we don't understand that liberty and we start uh, categorizing labeling them then putting many other things so i want to say as a young child or a young adult i may not be that intelligent enough to understand the society to understand the state to understand the nation to understand the modes to enter and understand the all your wonderful pursuits of what you call as uh, human rights 
all the entrepreneurs of the pursuit of the best practices. What are the best practices? How do I understand at the young days, at the adult days, I only understand what I like and what I don't like. And what I like, why I like, how do I know? Why do I like something? Why did I study law? Nobody told me that you studied law. And why did I study science? Probably that is the age we make this sense, but we don't know why to make rest, uh, this sense. Then after studying something, sometimes we click ourselves to say, yes, I have done a good study. I have got the right thing. Sometimes after studying and doing and completing the whole of the job, I feel I am not in the group. So, for example, I'll tell you in India, in context, most of the parents will be interested in our age when we are children that you should study medicine. But uh, you, the whole country and the regulation system made this particular medical education so costly and so difficult that a right person may not study medicine. An affluent person may be able to study medicine, but he may not be able to give the best of the service to the society. And things can happen that way. In other words, the responsibility of the mind, the way the mind thinks, uh, the whole theory of liberty comes over here. The whole theory of right comes over here. And the whole theory of responsibility comes over here. How to fix this particular right and regulate? I, I, in, a, in a way, I, I'll tell you, I dispose the whole of the system. If I look to the best interest of the child and the best interest of the adults in Chikai, our best interest of the adult, young adults. And uh, when I say, when I say that particular, every particular society deserves the criminal it is, if the society deserves the criminal it is, how far the criminal is responsible for his crime? How far, the, how far you're going to link the mind and the responsibility and put him into jail? Yes, you guy who committed the crime, you must get into jail. And what is the jailing process? What is the incarceration process? What is the justification for this particular punishment? Because you are in a major number, I mean a minority, and you take a decision in democracy saying that this is the rule of law, and then you have violated the rule of law, you get into the jail. But ultimately, you have put a rebellion into the jail. You are creating a rebellion inside the jail, and you are creating a bigger criminal in the jail. So this is what my point is. I think that there is a lot of the things that we need to understand what is justice in this contest and related to the mind also. I tell you now as a grown up person, I have wonderful minds. I have very excellent mind. I understand things. I can relate everything. I can connect everything, but my body doesn't permit me. And I'm, I, I really can't do all the things what I've done as a young adult. Yes, I, I enjoy that particular for a moment trekking. I could have walked around 60 kilometers, 70 kilometers in a, a free style and uh, enjoyed the nature, beauty, and I have synchronized my mind, body, and uh, intellect. But today, at this age, though my mind is clear, my body doesn't permit me. At the time, my body was there ready, but my mind was not ready. So this synchronized of body and mind at the adulthood, at the young adulthood, and at the elderly days, there's a big disconnect. Now, I have every opportunity I can go for trekking, but my body will not permit me. And at the time, I had every particular opportunity to go trekking, but my, uh, what I should say, not exactly mind, mind is connected with money, money and uh, other things in the society that did not connect. So there is a gap. That gap need be addressed. The same person, as a child is something different. As an adult is something different. And this particular difference is because of the connect between the mind and the body. You are biology and the mind. And if you have, your mind is the product of a biology, but still there is a gap. There is gap. 90% of the sexual offenses do happen because the mind and body do not synchronize. If the mind and body would have synchronized, there would not have been a sexual offense. And you call it a sexual offense, I say it's a, it's, it's a pathologically, there is something serious wrong. And we don't understand the pathology, we try to clear, we try to only punish the morphology. 
So, friends, uh, it's a very interesting subject. I think uh, I can speak loudly on this particular things for a long time, speak to myself for a long time, but I don't uh, intend to take your time. Uh, uh, and I'll be happy to listen the experts who have come over here, and that too from Yale University. And uh, I welcome, I welcome, sir, and I wish you all good luck. I hope you'll have a very wonderful uh, thought provoking discussions, and I'm sure so you'll collect all the material, and uh, I'll have the opportunity of going through all this material later on. And today I may be excused because I have a selection committee to address within another half an hour. Thank you very much for giving this opportunity. I beg an apology, I will not be able to stay in this particular wonderful webinar, though it sounds very attractive to me with the topic, the, the very title and, the, uh, you know, the way I'm involved in this type of thinking, I, I could have been there very much, but kindly excuse me, I'll not be present. And I will definitely interact with each one of you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, I see uh, Professor Siddharth, Arvita, uh, Devalina, and also Manisha, and other friends. Thank you very much. Thank Namaste. You, Thank you so much, sir, for your guidance. This is always what we all want to be look up to. Uh, now, I would request Ms. Sindhi Abhilasha uh, to introduce us to the speaker. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Smriti Abhilasha from LLM batch of 2020-21 of Kids School of Law. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce Professor Francis Shane as one of the resource persons of the second international webinar on law, brain, and mind sciences. Uh, Professor Francis X. Shane uh, is an associate professor of law in University of Minnesota. He is an executive director and an affiliated faculty member in the Harvard, Massachusetts General Hospital Center for Law, Brain, and Behavior. He is an uh, instructor in psychology, NGH Department of Psychiatry in Harvard Medical School. Uh, Professor Francis is a student of Harvard Law School, and he has done his PhD on government and social policy in Harvard University. Professor Francis is a co-author of a course book named Law and Neuroscience published in 2014, which happens to be the first course book on law and neuroscience. He has authored and co-authored 27 articles in law, psychology, law, and neuroscience. A few of the articles are, can neuroscience and artificial intelligence stop solitary confinement? Law and Neuroscience 2.0, Neuro Legislation, How US Legislators Are Using Brain Science. He has given more than 150 presentations in law and in law and neuroscience. Professor Francis has two books published under his name and 10 articles where he has either been an author or a co-author in the field of political science and education. Uh, Professor Francis has been awarded 12 fellowships. Few of them are University of Minnesota Institute for Advanced Study Residential Faculty Fellowship, University of Minnesota McKnight Presidential Fellowship, awarded to five most promising newly tenured faculty members at the University of Minnesota. University of Minnesota McKnight Land Grant Professorship Award awarded to promising junior faculty members for their originality and innovation in research. Professor Francis has received 12 grants starting from the year 2004. The most recent ones are National Institutes of Health Bioethics Supplement Grant and National Institutes of Health Neuroethics Supplement Grant. Professor Francis has professional affiliations with American Association of Law Schools, Society for Neuroscience, American Political Science Association, Society for Empirical Legal Studies, International Neuroethics Society, and American Association for the Advancement of Science. Uh, recently, Professor Francis has been awarded American Law Institute's 
Early Career Scholars Medal for being a pioneer in establishing the interdisciplinary field of law and neuroscience. We are honored and privileged to have Professor Francis among us who will deliberate on the topic introduction to the research on neuroscience and law. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you uh, very much to uh, everyone and very nice to see you and be with you today. I say good morning to you, though here and where I am in the United States, it's good night <laughs> where uh, it's late. So, um, but this is very exciting and it's nice to see so many people and um, I'm really looking forward to it. So I will share my slides. Um, hopefully you can see my, my slides, yes? Okay, very good. Um, and my goal is to introduce some, uh, at a broad level, uh, the concepts around neuroscience and law and rather than go in depth on any one particular item i'll sort of give an overview of where the research is right now and uh, with um, some reference to um, uh, india and cases there but um, with some primary reference as comparison to the to the united states but i think there are many parallels and of course you've already mentioned the uh, selvi uh, brain mapping case and i look forward to hearing more about that as well. And I'll mention um, one case in the United States that's somewhat related. So uh, also, I want to say uh, at a personal note, um, you know, thank you, um, Professor, uh, for bringing me here. And of course, to all of you, I hope um, that you're doing well and, and staying safe. I know it's a very difficult uh, time given COVID. And so I'm glad that we can still still meet, but I'm sure it's very stressful. So we're thinking uh, thinking of you. So this is uh, the uh, lab that I run. Uh, it's called uh, NeuroLaw Lab. And our motto is that every story is a brain story. And that's sort of the motivation for my work. This comes, this next slide is not my lab. This is a different lab. But I love this image because it's the beating brain. And one of the challenges that the law has is that we can't see the brain at work the vast majority of us will go through our lives and will never, unless we we're fortunate enough to join someone in surgery or unfortunate enough, I suppose, to be in brain surgery, we will never ever see our most precious organ at work. And because of that, the history of law has made lots of assumptions about what's going on inside the head. And really the field of law and neuroscience is about beginning to understand what's actually going on inside the head. And by the way, the brain connected with the rest of the body, the gut microbiome, the brain in relationship to the environment, which matters a lot, whether it's environmental toxins or nurturing from parents or whatever it might be. Um, but I, I just really love this image because right now, although you can't feel it, uh, even if you put your, you know, if I put my hand on my skull, I, I can't actually feel my brain working, but it is. And this is a reminder to me and for our work that um, this mystery uh, is really what, what makes us human. So what do we do in my lab? We do a lot of empirical work. Uh, we also do a lot of education and outreach and policy work. And I'll talk about some of the work we do. Um, the introductory remarks um, already talked about some of the things like mind reading, lie detection, criminal intent, um, mental injuries, admissibility of evidence, dementia issues, uh, sport concussion, uh, artificial intelligence, and, and regulation of technologies. I won't be able to talk about all of this, but uh, I'll talk about some of it. For the students, uh, so you know, I teach a lot of courses. I teach courses in criminal law and evidence, uh, US criminal law, US evidence. I teach um, uh, law and neuroscience and neuroethics and uh, have also taught some other, other courses. One thing I, I wanna note at the outset, and this is from a piece that I wrote uh, a few years ago, is that there needs to be a lot more of these sorts of events. And so I'm very glad that you're doing this work because right now the scholarship published on law and neuroscience is very centered on the United States and Western Europe, um, probably about 85%, I think, uh, or I'm guessing, but somewhere around there of the publications are just really centered on those um, uh, legal contexts. And of course, that's a very small slice of the world. Um, and so, uh, you know, increasingly, one of the benefits of, of more Zoom meetings is that um, I've been able to have a lot more conversations with colleagues in South America, in Asia, um, 
in other parts of the of the country. And so I, I'm glad that uh, we're having this conversation. We need more of it. A couple of places to go for more information if you like what you hear today. One is lawneuro.org. This is the home of the MacArthur Foundation Research Network on law and neuroscience. And there's a searchable bibliography. And if you publish work, I hope you'll add it to the bibliography. It's free and you can go um, check it out. And the other is the center that I direct uh, at Harvard called the Center for Law, Brain and Behavior. Uh, and we also have materials that in all of our events or previous events, you can watch the videos, uh, you can learn a lot there. At the center, our mission is this. We believe that better decisions aligned with science can produce better outcomes aligned with justice. And, and I'll talk about some of those instances, but also some ways in which there have been misuse and abuse of neuroscience and law. So I just want to, I'll talk about the past, uh, the present, and the future. Um, and I think it's important to start with the past because there is, both in the United States and in other countries, uh, a history of law and neuroscience. Uh, I won't go into it in detail, but I'll give just a little bit of data and a couple of notes. So one piece of data is, of course, the thing now is uh, the hot image is, is MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, but electroencephalography also very important. Electroencephalography, EEG. So I, you know, um, for those who don't know, the since the brain communicates chemically and electrically, you can measure it, you know, those chemical um, changes, or you can measure the electrical changes. And EEG is a little skull cap that was invented at really towards the beginning of the 20th century. This is just the number of US cases that have involved uh, electroencephalography. And you can see even as, you know, there are hundreds of cases, you know, even in the 1960s already. Right? So there's been a, a number of those cases. So there is a history uh, here. There are also um, some unfortunate moments in the history of law and neuroscience. Um, although modern books are still asking, this is by a neurochromonologist named Adrian Rain at the University of Pennsylvania. And he wrote a book called The Anatomy of Violence, where he did PET scans, positron emission tomography scans of those who've murdered and compare them to controls of those who don't, trying to uncover this question of what is the murdering brain like? I actually just want to mention that 40 years before Dr. Rain's work, and, and Adrian Rain is a friend, I like his work, um, two other scholars, they were both at Harvard, um, tried to do the same thing in a book called Violence in the Brain. They practiced psychosurgery, so that was the cutting of certain parts of the brain out in order to try and um, either treat uh, a psychopathology or potentially, they thought, um, eliminate violent tendencies. 40 years later, this work wasn't even cited uh, by Dr. Rain. It had fallen out of favor. Why? Because um, really the psychosurgery movement in the, in the 60s and the early 70s uh, really just wasn't good enough. Um, they thought they were, but they weren't. 40 years before that, back uh, in um, 1930s and then uh, wins an award, the Nobel Prize in 1949, Igas Moniz um, develops this tool, which if you can see it on your screen, some of you may recognize this as the tool for the prefrontal lobotomy. Um, there were commentators in the United States at the time and students at Yale Law School, our top law school, who thought this would be, quote, a major contribution to the cure of criminals. Right? And they were excited because this won a Nobel Prize, very, um, you know, very impressive. And yet this also, as you, I think, hopefully know, uh, the prefrontal lobotomy turned out to be a major failure. So I mentioned these historical moments because it's important to remain humble and to recognize that this organ, this three pound um, organ in our heads, the brain is so complicated and um, so mysterious that I, I think anyone who comes along whether it's in 1933 or 1973 or 2021 and says, aha, I have it all figured out. I know how the brain works and I have a simple intervention. Um, we should be very skeptical of those sorts of claims. And as a field, I hope what we're trying to do now is be much more uh, nuanced and much more detailed and cautious and patient with, um, with this intersection of law and neuroscience. Okay, so let me move then to the present and talk about uh, what's happening. And there is a lot happening uh, right now in law and neuroscience. About 10 to 15 years ago, it was really more of a philosophical exercise 
you know, philosophers were asking, did my neurons make me do it? Do we have free will? This is a refrigerator magnet you can buy. My brain tumor made me do it. Well, today it's not just academic questions. There are many, many, and by many, I mean thousands of real world cases in the United States. And there are many cases across the world in other uh, jurisdictions where um, both as a criminal defense, potentially also by use by prosecutors and also in civil claims, brain science is showing up in the courtroom. Why is this? The fundamental reason is that, as my colleague Owen Jones and I have suggested, a lot in law hinges on how brains work. And in fact, I would go further and suggest that virtually all of the major um, decisions that law is making are in some ways implicating brain science in one way or another. Some more, of course, more directly than others. Um, but this, again, is the organ that allows us to do, to do law. It's the, it's the thing that allows a judge to decide, uh, a lawyer, an advocate to argue. Um, it is the thing that is the organ that is allowing you right now to process the information through your sensory organs and make some sense of it. So um, a lot hinges on how brains work. And there's a recognition of this. So there are many more publications. This is just a graph that remember that bibliography I mentioned on lawneuro.org. This is just a graph of the cumulative number of publications going up and up. And again, I hope that um, there will be more contributions from your law school and your university. This is just a graph of cases in the United States. And in fact, it only goes through 2012. It's, the data is a little older, but the updated data, this comes from Nita Farahani, she says would continue to go up. These are just cases in criminal appellate cases because that's where our data come from. Um, but there are other data points. This is from uh, US law professor Debbie Denno looking at what types of cases brain science is used. So brain damage, head injury, uh, malingering, meaning is someone really in pain um, and some other types of cases. There are a variety of types of evidence being used. Uh, CT scans, MRI, EEG, PET scans, SPECT, uh, and quantitative electroencephalography, QEEG as well. So a real range of purposes and uh, notes. Uh, we just recently published the second edition of our course book uh, a few months ago at the end of 2020. And just in the six years between the first edition and the second edition, 45% of our material is new. That is how fast the field is moving. So almost half of our book simply didn't exist six years ago. The cases had not been decided, the science had not been completed, and the commentary had not been published. So this is a very fast moving field. And you know, if I came back in another five years, I would have very different slides and, and some very different conclusions because it's just moving that, that fast. Um, just to give you one example of um, how things have moved in the United States, I'll talk about um, this maybe a little bit later. I'll just mention it now. There have been a number of court decisions here in our US Supreme Court related to juvenile and young adult offenders. And starting in 2005 and actually going through, there was just a case handed down last week, Jones, so I haven't had a chance to update this slide. The US Supreme Court has recognized in part based on psychology and neuroscientific evidence that it is no longer in the US constitutional to put juveniles to death, to have automatic life without the possibility of parole, um, even uh, and to have a life without parole at all for non-homicide offenders. Um, the, the sorts of cases that come up um, are like Roper v. Simmons. This was the adolescent who was 17 and he uh, viciously killed this um, victim. Uh, the court there and then the court in another case where is the victim that was uh, killed again quite viciously by the defendant. Uh, the court ruled in both cases that um, because as you can almost see in the image, um, they were so young at the time of their crime that um, their developmental, uh, cul their culpability was less, their potential for rehabilitation was greater and therefore um, they could not be sentenced to death and even Miller could not be put uh, automatically into life without the possibility of parole without more careful consideration. In other contexts, the Supreme Court has also cited neuroscience as a very different context, but this was a question about violent video games and can a state regulate the sale of these video games to children? Uh, in a dissent, Judge Justice Breyer cited um, neural patterns and neuroscience. So Supreme Court is even citing neuroscience. Um, 
but it's not just at the high levels, it's at the regular levels as well. In the United States, uh, as in some other countries, uh, almost all of our cases plea bargain. They don't go to a jury trial, they don't go to a judge bench trial. It is a deal worked out between the prosecuting attorney and the defense attorney. And this is one attorney, uh, Stephen Cobb, who regularly uses um, brain imaging for his clients. He has discovered, he says, that he gets better outcomes when he presents to the prosecution brain images of his clients. He's trying typically to get uh, mental health treatment or to get a reduced sentence, and it seems to work. Now, there are some questions to be raised about the brain evidence that he's using, uh, and I'm on record as saying there's some questions, but I've spoken with attorney Cobb and his argument is that, look, um, the prosecution has a lot of tools and resources. Uh, this seems useful for me to use. So it's, it's starting to happen, it, though we should ask some questions about the efficacy of the, of the imaging. It's also showing up in cases around criminal responsibility. So um, Cobb is not arguing about responsibility. He's arguing really about what the sentence should be. But some cases do get to this question of, is a defendant culpable? And probably the most talked about case in neuro law uh, here in the United States is the case of Herbert Weinstein. This is a picture of Mr. Weinstein. It's a case that's uh, two decades old now, um, actually three decades old, but still resonates. And in fact, his daughter just published, I just got the book uh, this morning, uh, his daughter published a memoir about this case. Um, so he came home one day, he was about 65 years old, and he lived in New York City, and he came home and he strangled his wife and threw her out the window of their 12-story apartment building to make it look like a suicide. He had no previous history of violence. Um, and what he did, why this case was unique, is he argued that he couldn't appreciate right from wrong. This is a picture of him, by the way, a close-up. And he introduced, wanted to introduce this evidence, the MR scan and the uh, positron emission tomography scan showing a large cyst, an arachnoid cyst uh, in his frontal lobe. His argument was that this was relevant to his case because the frontal lobes, as you probably know, are at least um, uh, partially responsible for regulating um, uh, uh, you know, higher order cognitive function and executive control on decision making, especially impulse control. Um, and he said this was relevant. The judge in that case, it was a case of first impression, had to decide whether a jury should be able to see these scans. The reason it's a useful teaching case is that it raises a number of questions that are bigger than just this one case. For instance, we know nothing. We knew, no we knew nothing in 1991, and we know nothing in 2021 about the base rate of people walking around with cysts like this who are perfectly normal. We know nothing about the relationship, either the causal or the correlational relationship between having a brain abnormality like this and violence. We just, we don't know. Um, it could be that there are many, many, many other individuals who have similar brain abnormalities who can appreciate right from wrong and who um, don't act with such uh, violent tendencies. So the question then for the judge remains, and it would be the same today really, is given that we don't know that, but also that we do know something about the uh, frontal lobes, this is clearly an abnormality. He, you know, he didn't make up the abnormality. Is it good enough evidence? Is it relevant enough for a jury to see? And those sorts of questions can be asked in a lot of the law and neuroscience cases. Uh, and I hope you'll be asking them uh, in a number of cases that, that you see. Uh, I'm on record as suggesting that neuroscientific evidence may have its uh, greatest import um, as instant replay, as additional evidence when there's a lot of behavioral evidence, but when it's not entirely clear. So this is a picture of, you know, U.S. officials for U.S. football, American football, trying to figure out what actually happened on a play. Um, and this wasn't possible until about, I don't know, 25 years ago. It's gotten much better. And this too wasn't possible, right? There just were no images to see. As I said before, at the start, um, we have never been able to see inside the skull up until really only um, a few decades ago. And so I think we'll see more of this. I don't think we'll see it in all cases, but I think we will see it in important cases. 
and in cases where um, there's some real mystery. And maybe, maybe the brain science can help us uh, figure out that mystery. So let me ask another question, which you might be wondering is, wait a second, can brain evidence persuade jurors? Does it matter at all? Like, so would it matter if a juror or a judge saw brain evidence? Well, there's some evidence, to, some, I should say some data to suggest the answer is yes, though the, the re, uh, research is mixed. Um, we could talk more about that if you want. The research is mixed, but this is a case where the answer was yes. So this is another defendant in the United States. This was a capital sentencing, which means death penalty case. So Mr. Nelson um, was clearly guilty of a number of crimes, including murder. He stabbed his wife 60 times, then slashed her throat and killed her. He sexually assaulted his stepchildren. He had many prior convictions, including um, raping a child. And the prosecutor sought the death penalty. So the way this case worked is that it went to a jury and a jury had to decide should this defendant, Mr. Nelson, go to death row and receive the death penalty, or should he receive life without the possibility of parole? He introduced, via an expert named Robert Thatcher, quantitative electroencephalography evidence. Here's a close-up of the picture, so-called brain map evidence. And I should say again that I'm on record and published as saying, I think this evidence was very problematic to be introduced. His argument was, that this evidence supported the claim, his lawyer's evidence supported the claim that he had a broken brain and that um, not entirely unlike Weinstein, he should not be held fully responsible for his actions uh, at sentencing. His attorney said to the jury, he said, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, um, this doesn't excuse his actions, but it explains them. Now I wanna go back to this question, can brain evidence persuade jurors? Well, the answer in that case was yes. So what I'm gonna do is read for you, I've got the quotes right here, um, what the jurors said. So in the United States, um, you can, if you want, if you're a juror, speak to the newspaper afterwards. And three jurors in this case spoke to the newspaper. Uh, here's what they said. Oh, I should tell you what the, what the verdict was. Six, six, uh, 12 jurors, six said death penalty, six said no death penalty. In Florida, it was in the state of Florida, you need a simple majority. So if it had been seven to five, he would have received the death penalty. So every vote counted. Here's what three of the jurors said. Juror Dolores Cannon, she was a hospital secretary. She said, quote, when the brain evidence came in, the facts about the QEEG, some of us changed our mind. Then another one, juror John Howard, an airport fleet services worker. That evidence, the brain evidence, turned my decision all the way around. The technology really swayed me. After seeing the brain scans, I was convinced this guy had some sort of brain problem. Now, they didn't all agree. So the last quote I'll give you, juror Leon Benbo, he was a retired mailman. And he said, quote, all that scientific testimony, that was a waste of taxpayer money. That's phony. There's nothing wrong with that guy's brain. So. I don't know whether, of course, there was anything wrong with Mr. Nelson's brain, but what I do know is that these sorts of cases are showing up uh, more and more. They're also showing up uh, in a series of cases. If you want to talk more about them, we could relate it to the addicted brain. Uh, there was a case, a notable case uh, from two years ago, although it was not successful, it raised this question. The, uh, defendant in the case was named Julie, Julie Eldred. And she went on probation. And one of the, pro because she had stolen some money, she was an addicted to opioids, to heroin. She uh, stole some, uh, I think, jewels to pay for her drugs. Okay, so she's arrested and she gets put on probation. And the number one probation condition is don't do drugs, remain drug free. Well, about 10 days later, she relapses. She uses heroin again. She argued that it was unconstitutional to require her to remain drug free because she didn't have a choice about whether or not to use drugs again. She said that would be like requiring me to not get cancer. I can't control whether I get cancer or not, and I can't control whether I use the drugs or not. She lost the argument in court, but she cited a lot of neuroscience in making her argument. Uh, and those types of questions are, are being raised uh, in real cases. Uh, 
I know that there's some in, I, I think, your school and your area who study law enforcement, lie detection. So I want to mention a little bit about those uh, cases as well. The center that I mentioned, the Center for Law, Brain, and Behavior, we just ran a program uh, two weeks, well, a little under uh, a few weeks ago, on policing and the brain. Uh, as you may have followed uh, in international news, the uh, United States right now is really having a lot of um, debate and uh, sometimes very hostile debate about law enforcement, and in particular, the relationship between law enforcement and African American youth. Uh, I'm coming to you from the city of Minneapolis right now, and in our city, it's been very, very um, uh, uh, a big deal. And this asked the question of what are police thinking when they take out a gun and shoot uh, someone? You know, um, we had a case here just three weeks ago in which a police officer yelled taser taser thought she was reaching for her taser but pulls out instead a gun and shoots uh the young man that they were pursuing and kills him um you know what is the brain doing when it makes that mistake so we we you know got into some of those questions i think the bottom line argument the sort of, sort of finding that's relevant from neuroscience is that the, the biases and the behavioral instincts can be unlearned or can be learned, but they have to be done through significant practice. And so the idea as one of our colleagues and experts on this panel said that you can just go to a training, a debiasing training, you know, some Saturday morning and suddenly, oh, everything's okay. That's, you know, th that is not at all uh, going to be useful. And of course, we know that in our own lives. Um, you know, if someone says brush your teeth, you can say, okay, I get, I know, or eat your vegetables or, you know, do this. Um, it's one thing to know that you should do it. Uh, it's another thing to get in the behavioral pattern of doing it again and again. Let me also mention before I uh, move on to the future, a, a word about brain-based lie detection. We have had in the United States um, two types of cases uh, concerning brain-based lie detection. One, which I won't talk about here, but I'm happy to talk more about later, is the most akin to the Selvi line of cases, which is using EEG and looking at brainwave patterns to try and detect the presence or absence of certain memories, like a memory detection. Uh, I've actually published on that. I, in the interest of time, I'll talk just about the other type of case, which involved brain-based MRI lie detection. And here is the leading case. It's from 2010. It's called U.S. v. Semrau, and this is um, the uh, the defendant, Lauren Semrau. So the case facts were these: He was um, uh, alleged to do uh, allegedly uh, made fraudulent billing in what in our healthcare benefit program. The basic idea is he ran a company. And patients would come get some services. And then the way it works in the United States is you send in the bill to the US government and they reimburse you for the services. Okay, straightforward. Here's what he was doing and his company. He was sending in the wrong billing codes. Let's say it really cost $50. He'd send in a billing code for 100. And they kept doing this and doing this and doing this It'd make a lot of money, right? If you, but only if you, if you fraud, defraud the government. The thing was that the government, the, the prosecutor had to prove that he did this knowingly. That's a big mental state. And his argument was, I'm sorry, it was a big mistake. I didn't know that I was sending in the wrong codes. I'm sorry, but I didn't do it knowingly. The reason the case drew a lot of attention is that he wanted to put on the stand in front of the jury this expert. Stephen Lakin. I've sat down with Stephen Lakin for a few hours and talked to him about this case. And uh, I'll give you his, his side of the argument. This was his company, CFOS. You can see it, the science behind the truth. So they took the defendant and they brought him, it was actually in Massachusetts. They put him in an MRI scanner and they asked him a bunch of questions there where they know the answer. And they said, okay, answer honestly. That's the truth. Then they said, all right, here are a bunch of questions. We know the answer please lie. Okay, now we've got the idea conceptually, and I should say again, I'm on record as saying there are lots of problems with this approach. Um, and it, I'm uh, you know, on record as saying it should not have been admitted, and it wasn't. But Dr. Lakin would say, well, look, I know what the lying brain looks like, so-called, 
I know what the guilty brain looks like. Now I'm going to ask him the important questions about the case. Did you defraud the government? And I will look at his brain patterns to see if it seems like when he answers those key questions, he is lying or not. And Dr. Lakin wanted to get on the stand and say, I, in my professional opinion, I, Dr. Stephen Lakin, conclude that Dr. Semra's brain indicates he is telling the truth in regards to not cheating or defrauding the government. This case also raises a lot of questions. Now, the bottom line was that the judge rejected this uh, evidence, excluded it. So no, uh, none of this evidence has never, appear, has never appeared in a US court. And it's, that's the right answer. Why is that the right answer? A, a number of reasons. Um, let me just give you a couple of them. One is that we don't actually know ground truth. We do not actually know what the brain looks like when it is lying or when it is not. Um, the particular test that they ran had not been uh, even conceptually uh, vetted, let alone um, even if we assume some things were true, uh, would it, it would have been ready. Um, and now Lakin would have replied, OK, so maybe my science isn't 100% right. And he didn't say it was. Let the jury decide that. Have some other expert get up in front of the jury and say that I'm no good, and then cross-examine me. But don't keep it from the jury entirely. And that's another big question uh, that this case raises about evidence, um, which is what um, should a jury see at all? And, what, and even with cross-examination and other experts, and what evidence is so shaky and problematic that it should not be seen, uh, not be seen at all? One other issue as well is um, the, called the group to individual inference problem. And I'll just mention it here before I talk about the future. So the group to individual inference problem is gonna show up in a lot of law and neuroscience cases. It shows up in all the juvenile justice cases that I mentioned. It shows up in the addiction cases. It shows up in the lie detection cases. And what is it? It's this issue that even though on average, a group may have certain characteristics, and even though on average, a group of brains may have certain characteristics, it does not necessarily follow that the particular individual, the particular defendant in the case shares those characteristics. Okay. To give a clear example, it is very clear that on average, most 17 year olds are more impulsive and have less sort of executive control than most 40 year olds. That's, there's tons of evidence to suggest that. However, it is not the case that if you take any one 17 year old out of that group, that that one 17 year old necessarily has you know, uh, a less uh, impulse control. And therefore, again, this question is, well, so should you uh, go with the group or should you look at the individual characteristics? And we're going to see that group to individual issue show up here as I give an example from the aging brain uh, and dementia as well. Okay, so let me talk about the future, about several things, and then I'll get to this last thing that I'll talk about, which is the challenge, the coming challenge of biomarkers, which is going to be a, a really big deal here. So here are three principles, I think, as we kind of move forward. One, I take a very broad definition of law and neuroscience. So law to me is not just the courtroom, but also the legislature. Right, or could be, uh, and I've, I've written on that, I didn't have time to talk about it, but there are, are many, many uh, pieces of legislation that are now influenced by neuroscience. And neuroscience itself is a, is a concept that includes many disciplines, increasingly, by the way, disciplines like artificial intelligence and neuroengineering. Um, so neuroscience is a big field as well. Uh, second, um, I am gonna say a word about this in a moment. There is a whole nother body of law, which is regulatory law, that plays a role in the development of those technologies to begin with. For instance, can they be marketed to consumers? What um, and and you know where is research funding going? So it's like a two-way street, and I'll talk about that. And then third, uh, this goes back to the theme that I started with: we have to be very patient. Uh, th there is just so much unknown about brain science that, as excited as I am about the future. Uh, I really want to be patient as well, which is not, you know, it's not easy to be patient, but we have to be. Okay, just quickly, a broad definition of law and neuroscience. If we had a whole week, you know, if this is when I teach the whole seminar, we cover all of these areas. We talk about um, uh, international governance, not just FTC and FTC, actually, we talk about international 
governance. We talk about older brains here, elder law. We talk about environmental law. So, so much of environmental law and toxins are concerned with the brain and they're things you can't see, right? It's like, oh, I'm just breathing in air. I'm just, you know, drinking some water. And then you begin to see the differences. If you want to have a day of research, you know, a topic, animal law, right? As we learn more and more about non-human, so we're animals also, but if we look at non-human animal brains, um, these are of course, and by the way, human animal chimera work, which is happening as well um, and published on that. There are a lot of questions we could delve in about evidence law, tort law, all sorts of brain injury cases and civil suits, lots of constitutional law questions contract law, did someone have the capacity to consent? There's a lot of insurance law here, disability, lots of questions around privacy law, health law, and, and other fields. So there's a lot here. And as I said, uh, law and artificial intelligence is just one of other areas that really intersects a lot with neuroscience. And one of the ways it does is, um, and this is a, a program that I put together and that I've kind of followed up along. There's something called deep phenotyping, also known as computational phenotyping, digital phenotyping. And the idea is that right now in psychiatry, for the most part, uh, psychiatrists and other mental health experts have to rely almost entirely on self-report. So if someone goes into the office, say, well, you know, how have you been feeling the last month? You know, tell me a little bit. Increasingly, there's 24 seven collection of data through smartwatches, through cell phones, through other devices. There's collection of lots of other data. You can add brain data and you begin to create a very different picture of someone. This raises all sorts of questions around privacy, efficacy and the like. And it's gonna cross over into criminal justice. It already, already has. Okay, I could say a lot more about that but this is like, again, high level overview. Second, I mentioned this governance role. So I'm gonna show you a picture of a device that doesn't exist yet, but is coming soon. And I could actually show you a picture of device if you, if you want to of, um, which actually being used in parts of India as well of a mobile MRI device. Uh, the one in, in being used in India is developed by a company called Hyperfine. And these scanners are um, moving all over the country. We've been looking at the ethics here. I, um, and, but the reason, and it's really accessible MRI. So this was a conference in 2019 uh, in India and uh, my colleagues, I wasn't there in person, but my colleagues organized it and, and we're now working with them. The idea is that uh, for medical purposes, there ought to be a whole lot more access to MRI. And that's, that's happening. Well, guess what? as more and more access emerges for MRI for medical purposes, there's gonna be more and more opportunity for MRI to come into the legal system as well. Why don't we see more MRIs in court? Because they're expensive and impossible to get, right? You see all sorts of other evidence because it's easy. Why is fingerprint evidence? Because fingerprints are really easy to get, right? So as the barriers fall to getting an MRI, and again, and I can, should actually show you an image of the van that we think we're gonna get, which is gonna be a portable MRI. We can drive it around and just um, stop outside the house. This is already happening in research and just get an MRI. You can pull it right up to the prison, to the jail. We're just gonna see more and more of this. So again, as I said, if I come back in five years, um, I don't need this slide. I, I, I think I'd show you lots of, of real examples. So that's happening. Uh, and I guess the last point is that in doing this, we have to think really carefully about the ethics because on one hand, it might be great. On the other hand, one could imagine this being a tool of oppression uh, and of discrimination um, quite easily, actually. Um, and it could actually exacerbate inequalities uh, and biases. Okay, and then the last part is we really need to be patient. And by that, I mean, I think we have to maintain really high, uh, high standards. At the same time, high standards for you know when we allow brain science into the courtroom, at the same time, We've got to really, in my view, examine doctrine. So this comes from uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. who said that there's no better reason, it's revolting to have no better reason for a rule of law than it was so laid down in the time of Henry IV, meaning that this we just do this because we've always done it and we always do it. Um, and it's still re more revolting if the grounds upon which it has laid down have vanished long since. And I think there are gonna be a number of places, addiction in my mind is one of them, where our assumptions about why someone does something, it's a moral failing. You chose to use that heroin again, right? You chose, I think we're gonna think differently about that. All right, so let me give you some reasons to be optimistic. Um, one is that there's just more and more new knowledge and new technology. This amazes me. You know, 
over t almost two, and if you add since 2013, like we're talking about two million publications around somewhere around brain and neuroscience. We've got fancy new equipment. So this is, you know, these 10.5 Tesla, which is like, what, how can you be, all this new equipment, all the mobile MRI I've just mentioned to you. Uh, a second reason to be optimistic is I have seen in my own work evidence of real change. I won't go into detail, I don't have time, but I'll just mention for you that at our Harvard program, we run a workshop on science-informed decision-making. We've done it for four years. We have judges and their staff coming from all over the United States. They come, they spend three days with us. They learn about neuroscience, addiction, mental health. They work in teams with their probation and parole officer. They come as teams, like five or six. And then they go back to their districts and many of them have changed their practices. And here is one judge who's on record as saying, because of the program, I learned about what it takes to understand trauma, to understand the individual, to come up with an individual approach. Um, and we're seeing those things happening around juvenile justice. Uh, this was a program we ran last summer um, with the youth organization around developing brains. So we're seeing a lot more of that. Now, I mentioned biomarkers, and this is in my last few minutes, I just wanna um, raise these questions for you. So one of the things that are, is happening in, in uh, clinical world and the medical world is the movement towards biomarkers. And as an example, um, we're exploring what are the legal implications of early detection of elevated risk for autism spectrum disorder. And I'll actually uh, then to go to the other end of the spectrum and talk about uh, dementia and Alzheimer's. So there are colleagues here at the University of Minnesota and around the world actually, who are, as the headline says, identifying autism biomarkers in infancy. They put six month year old babies into a brain scanner. They look at the brain patterns they then can predict with quite good accuracy whether or not at age two, that infant now two years old will end up on the autism spectrum. Why are they doing that? Because early intervention in autism has shown to be very beneficial. And so they don't wanna wait till two, they wanna get earlier and earlier. But these raises all kinds of problems for the law because that data is probabilistic. That is a guess, right? An 82% chance that the kid might develop autism. How should the law handle that? And the answer is great uncertainty. The law, the, the law in the US and around the country, around the world, doesn't know how to handle probabilistic biomarkers uh, because we think yes or no, guilty or not guilty, either you've got it or you don't. We don't how, know how to handle 87% likelihood with some error around it. And that's gonna be the same for the aging brain as well. I work a lot on aging brain issues, um, Alzheimer's and other types of dementia. We've talked about aging brains and aging politicians. We talk about um, care for the aging. And a piece that we wrote was about the legal implications of detecting Alzheimer's disease earlier. Now, one thing to say is that we don't have uh, a big red thing. There's some company, there was a company here in the United States that said they were gonna provide imaging comprehensive and definitive. Well, that's not allowed yet. We don't, we don't know definitive. We know probabilistic. So right now between a combination of PET and MRI, um, one can look at changes in brain structure at the development of amyloid plaques and a few other you know, blood biomarkers and make a pretty good prediction about whether or not someone's brain is abnormal. But here's the group to individual inference problem. We don't know whether that one individual is still okay, is still legally, and do they have the requisite capacity? And so here are questions that the law is gonna to have to ask. What if any legal right should be taken away based on brain circuit abnormalities? Should evidence be admitted, say in an elder financial fraud case, if you're doing a criminal prosecution, um, you know, can that be admitted? Um, and what if the treating physicians the experts begin to more and more rely on brain imaging. And this is true for all of the cases. What if your expert, who of course is gonna be able to testify is using brain imaging? Um, and again, what in, if an individual with dementia is needed to testify, you know, can brain imaging uh, be used in those, those contexts? So there are many other um, ways in which brain imaging will show up for very young, for very old, for everyone in between. The reason that we're gonna see more brain imaging in the world is not for law, it's primarily for medicine and for clinical reasons, but we're gonna then see the spillover. We're gonna see the spillover. 
the reason that DNA was researched had nothing to do with criminal law. It had nothing to do with criminal law. And yet once it emerged, once it was possible to look at this information, suddenly it became a major part of many cases. And that's what I think is going to happen here. Only DNA is really useful in a small segment of cases. And this brain science is going to be useful potentially or harmful in a really large number of questions. Why? Because every story, in my view, that the law takes is in some ways a brain story. Uh, we just don't really <laughs> know it yet because um, we've never had access to this brain data, but we will. And, you know, across the world, uh, we're going to have to handle these new types of cases. So I think I'm out of time, uh, but I hope that's given you a uh, an overview of at least what's happening in the United States and a little bit of what's happening around the world. And uh, well, you can tell I'm very excited about um, these developments and uh, I'm excited to see where things go. I'll stop there. Thank you, sir. Uh, now we, uh, we, are, um, we are thankful for such an enlightening discussion. We are really grateful to you, sir. Uh, now we would move forward to the discussions on the questions. I would request the participants to please jot down the questions in the chat box so that they can be addressed by the uh, on the speaker. Shall I just go answer these questions, ma'am? Should uh, that be or uh, so could I just read out for you? Yes. Okay. So may uh, ma'am, may I please read out the questions? Okay, uh, so the first question is uh, by Ishita Vanya Paul. Uh, Mr. C Ishita Vanya Paul, the question is, uh, uh, sir, can the characteristics of the brain of a murderer or a serial killer be inherited by his or her child? Can it be passed down? Is there any study done in this regard? No and yes. So there is some study being done. The best studies are being done by... Adrian Raines group. This was the book, uh, The Anatomy of Violence. There is deep disagreement. So that's yes, there's some research being done. There is deep disagreement about the first question. There is consensus that um, many behavioral traits have a genetic component. I mean, the best guess is all, my guess is always 50%. However, um, as the, the, there's also consensus that single gene studies or can, so-called candidate gene studies that there is a single gene or two genes that is the murdering gene or the psychopath gene, no one that I know uh, uh, believes that's the case. And so the complexity of the, uh, and the genome-wide genome association studies, the GWAS studies are indicating that um, <laughs> you know, more and more intricate connections explain sort of less and less of, of behavior. So, on one hand, yes, I'm sure there's some genetic component, but as a practical matter, um, I don't. I, I think there's so many other factors that would contribute to violent behavior generally, and specifically the um, question you asked. I mean, about the the worst of the worst serial killers, that I don't see that playing a large role. Now, Adrian Rain might give you a different answer. He has a chapter at the end of his book, so you should read it, um, where he, want, he envisions a future in which children will be screened. Again, this is his argument, not mine. Children will be screened based on their brain data and their genetic data, and that he thinks someday we will be able to identify those with a high likelihood or high probability of becoming very dangerous. Um, one more thing to say, of course, there is one way and with genetics is very, very good at predicting violence, and that is around biological sex. So the, if, if you look at male and female differences, they're stark, they're important. Um, and, you know, at least in the US right now, about 90% of incarcerated individuals, maybe it's a little like 87, are male. And that's a consistent over time and across, across the world. So, um, so it's not that genetics don't matter. It's that trying to predict something as rare, something as rare as being a serial, serial killer is just um, extremely difficult. But yeah, Adrian Rain might be, <laughs> might think something different. Thank you, sir. Uh, so the next question. Manisha, Puranjoy yes, sir has a question. I think uh, he has to post it to everyone. Puranjoy sir, please post it to everyone. 
Yes. So that Manisha can read the question. Should I continue with the other questions? Yes, continue, but uh, sir also has a question. Yes, I'll take okay. it. Yeah. Uh, so the next question is uh, from Mr. Shobhik Roy. He addresses it as, uh, Professor, how scientific is the science in itself? Also, to what extent can it reduce the risk of judicial bias? Can there be any absolutism in this regard? Uh, well, the science that I've talked about really varies the quality of the science. So um, science can be the some of the science is excellent neuroscience, but it's not very useful for the courtroom because it's not intended to address uh, an individual question. This is the group to individual inference problem. In general, in the United States, and I would actually venture across the world, forensic science has not been subject to the same sort of scrutiny and peer review process and scientific method that some other types of evidence have. Um, so we are reviewing in the United States right now, things like fingerprint evidence, bite mark evidence, uh, these sorts of, of pieces of evidence um, are very problematic. So it really varies, um, but you know, a lot, I, a, a lot of the, um, uh, say the science around addiction is very good on one hand. On the other hand, addiction is such a complicated brain disorder that we don't have great treatments. Same thing for Alzheimer's disease. We still have no cure worldwide. Every, every, sci every neuroscientist across the world who studies the aging brain is trying to address dementia. And yet after three decades or more of study, we still don't have um, a cure. So I, my view in general is that the neuroscience has made great progress, but that I'm in the camp that believes that the sort of the more we know, the more we realize we don't know, and that law is making big demands of neuroscience. So if law simply said, we just want to know about the motor cortex, how does this finger move? Oh, well, then we're great. Because not only do we know how this finger moves, we can actually stimulate my brain right now and make my finger move. That's how intricately we know it. But we're asking questions such as, what am I thinking while my finger moves? Am I, you know, am I interested? Am I angry? Am I happy? And there, um, neuroscience is really, uh, it's just, just starting out. So um, with regards to judicial bias, um, I mean, I guess I would just say that, um, uh, it depends how we define bias. And there are a number of mechanisms that one can imagine, um, both for judges and for attorneys and in other contexts, where a better understanding of um, our mental tendencies and the way that the brain encodes information, and then, um, then the way that that uh, information leads to behavior. If we know what our tendencies are, we can design systems that can try and reduce um, negative outcomes from those tendencies and those biases. Thank you, sir. Uh, so uh, the next question is from uh, Dr. Kuranjay Ghosh. Uh, uh, his question is, brain evidence is, if considered to be justified immunity from mens rea, then how the injury caused to the deceased or the society at large, like fraud, et cetera, would be addressed in the justice administration system? Yeah, so I think if the question is, as I understand it, is, um, it, uh, is there who takes responsibility um, if um, that if it's deemed that someone was uh, not not acting voluntarily? So at least in the U U.S. system, there would be um, if someone truly acted involuntarily. That is, if they had say um, an unknown seizure disorder, and the seizure just took them, and so they suddenly had a seizure and because of their seizure, you know, drove their car off the road and killed the victim. Uh, there might be some civil recovery under a different set of laws, but there would be no criminal conviction if it was truly, um, uh, truly not a voluntary act. There would also be potentially, and this is the question, it wouldn't be purposeful action. It wouldn't be knowing. It wouldn't be reckless. But again, if it was truly an unknown um, a seizure disorder, it just came out of nowhere and it likely wouldn't even be negligent. And so I, I think there would be no, um, 
uh, no criminal adjudication, no, no guilt. This leaves a lot of people very concerned in some situations. So I think it's a great um, question. Um, and, uh, and it's one of the reasons that most of the neuroscience has not gone to the responsibility side, the responsibility phase. Most arguments have not been successful to argue, my brain made me do it and I'm not responsible. Where there have been more um, successes and where I think there should be more emphasis. So I actually think that most of the time individuals are responsible is on sentencing. We say, okay, and in my view, we should treat someone differently based on why they did what they did because the intervention is likely to be different. So if someone stole $250 because they have a heroin addiction, I want to know that when I sentence them and have an intervention versus someone stole because they're just a really evil person and they love to steal money, right? To me, that offers, they're just guilty of the same crime, but they ought to receive some sort of different sentence um, in large part because the public safety implications are different and uh, you want to intervene differently. But it's a great question. And um, it gets to, I think, a major concern. Um, and also, last thing I'll say is that the US courts have not even considered, and if they did, they would wholly reject uh, hard determinism. So in the academic literature, in the philosophical literature, there are many neuroscientists and others who believe that we are all um, determined. So here's a pen, right? So you can see this pen. And if I drop this pen into my hand, None of you would say that this pen chose to land in my pen, my hand. In fact, if we knew the pen, the air resistance, you could predict exactly where it would land because it obeys the laws of physics. It's just a pen, right? Uh, there, are other, there are many who think that we are just like that. We have no free will. We are, to quote Josh Green and um, his colleague, uh, we are victims of our neuronal circumstances. Um, and uh, again, I reject that view, but, but there are many who believe it. And if you believe that, then one has to fund, completely redo uh, a criminal justice system from top to bottom. Um, that has, that's just not happened. I don't think that will happen, but there are many belie who believe others who believe that should happen. Thank you, sir. Uh, so there, is, uh, there are some, a few more questions. This question is from uh, Ms. Sushanta Pradarshini. She asks, if, is there any similarity between the brain mapping of serial killers or habitual offenders as in similar pattern? Uh, that I don't that I don't know. And I, I can't imagine that there's been enough research um, to, to look. So there's been, it's, I should emphasize, there has been a, only a little, 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 little bit of examination of the, um, the neurobiology of human violence across the world. Um, and that's because there's just been only a little, little bit of examination of human neurobiology generally. So um, only in the last five years in the United States have we had the first major longitudinal study of brain imaging with about 10,000 individuals. If you compare that to heart studies, we have so much information on the heart, which is why we know so much about the heart. It's an easier organ to study. And, um, and we just got a lot of more information. So yeah, so I, I don't know the answer, but nobody knows the answer. And I don't think we'll know the answer anytime soon um, because there's just not this longitudinal study. Almost all the studies that have happened have been cross-sectional where they have happened. Uh, and we just don't, what you'd ideally want to study is the brain over time, right? And the brain in its environment. And I saw there were some other questions about MAOA as well. I mean, that's been rejected a lot. The idea is, in, and I think in part because environmental factors are tremendously important for brain development. Uh, we are the most social creatures on earth and our brains develop, they wire to our environment. They wire to our circumstances, to our culture. Um, and, uh, and our mental health is so tied up in our culture and our friendships and you know our enemies and everything else. So. Uh, yeah, so the short answer, no. Um, and the long answer is, I don't think we'll have any data on that realistically anytime soon either. Thank you, sir. So the next question is from Arthur, Mr. Atul Anand. He asks about uh, having witnessed a large number of mass shootings in, uh, shooting in the US. Uh, this, uh, what leads to such kind of crime over there? Is it the lifestyle? Is it the mindset? 
Is it the parental upbringing of the criminals? Is it the hindered approach towards the society? Or is it due to the brain circuit abnormal abnormalities? So again, I'll say, I don't know, but I'll say that nobody knows. So there was um, uh, an uptick and then a decrease in crime in the 80s and then the 90s. And this has been the most studied trend of violence in the United States by criminologists, sociologists, economists. No one agrees on um, what the causes were, either for the surge in violence or its reduction. There are many plausible theories from access to victims, from uh, lead in the water, from uh, the economist Stephen Levitt, who's a famous economist for economics, argued that it had to do with changes in abortion uh, rules because of, I mean, there's all these different theories. Of course, one leading theory is um, related to gun, uh, access to guns. So um, when fights break out, it's a lot harder to kill someone if you're just fighting with a knife or a broken bottle. And it's a lot easier to kill someone either on accident or on purpose with a gun. Um, so uh, those are great questions. What happens is when someone doesn't know the answer uh, and the data is unclear, people um, use the answer that they want to to advance their policy agenda. So what happened in the United States um, is that in this earlier period in the, in the late 80s and the early 90s, there was a surge in violence and a narrative happened. It didn't have data behind it, but there's a narrative that there were super predators, super predator juveniles. And the way to handle these super predator juveniles was for much more harsh sentences. The, the phrase was adult time for adult crime. So sentence all those juveniles to life without prison, right? There was no data behind it, but it sounded good. Um, and uh, so it was plausible but it turned out not to be true. So yeah, we, we don't know the answer, um, but, uh, and, and I, I hope that we're patient in trying to figure out what the answer is, as opposed to jumping and, and you know, for political reasons, picking a policy response, um, but it's a mystery and, uh, and I don't know. It's Thanks. tragic, that's for sure. Thank you, sir. So uh, just two more questions. Uh, this question is from Ms. Pippi, uh, who asks, uh, what uh, is the admissibility of the lie detection test done during the interrogation of an alleged accused by the police, as it is seen in many cases that the result is not accurate? Yeah, so great question. So right now in the United States, uh, the polygraph and all other lie detection uh, equipment is allowed to be used for the most part during investigation, during police investigation. And it's routinely used in police investigation, but it's not generally admissible in court. So the law enforcement will use the polygraph. Uh, typically, let's say they have five potential um, uh, individuals who they don't know who did it, but they think it might be one of the five. They'll use the polygraph during the investigation to maybe narrow it down, but they can't later introduce that into, into court. Um, and then I think there might have been a second part of that question as well, which I forget, but um, but that's, that's, oh yes, go ahead, sorry. So should I repeat again the question? Um, yes, just the last part, but that's the admissibility question. It's not admissible in court, but it is admissible. Oh, uh, in the cases, the result is not accurate, I see. So yes, yes. Um, yeah, so, so that's right, yeah. And um, the reason it is excluded is that it's not deemed to be reliable enough. The, um, the memory detection evidence, uh, there's some work going on right now in New Zealand, uh, in Japan, and, um, and actually maybe we'll hear about this later in India and in the BIOS uh, that uses EEG, which is not so much lie detection directly, but is um, part of a, of a way to maybe get at truth uh, by trying to look at um, an automatic brain reaction to an image or a sound or a stimuli and the idea is that it might have forensic use because if only the true culprit, the true criminal was at the crime scene and their brain would react differently because they would have seen and interacted with these crime scene materials and someone who is innocent wouldn't have, their brain wouldn't have that same reaction. But it's only, it's still you know, being tested and it's not yet ready, but maybe someday. Thank you, sir. So the next question is uh, from Dr. Paramita Chokuraj. Madam uh, asked, uh, states that there are research findings on menoamine oxidase A-mayo-A gene 
which has been linked to aggressive behavior, but do you not see the negative policy implications with these kinds of findings like eugenics movement? Don't you feel the stakes are too high in including these research findings, especially in the criminal justice administration? The same may apply to using neuroscience in criminal justice administration. Yes, great question, and I agree. So the MAOA, I'm glad that somebody asked about it. Those were um, sort of described what I was calling before the single gene studies or the candidate gene studies. The line of argument there was um, based on really, I, I think now a body of evidence that many have gone back and critiqued heavily was that this one gene, this one gene variant was responsible. So it's the so-called warrior gene um, that it, um, in, in interaction with some other environmental factors could potentially explain uh, a violent uh, behavioral response. So I do think there's a real problem with simplifying human behavior in that way. And this is what I was saying at the outset, that we do not know why people do the things they do. We don't really know at a neurobiological level why we do the things we do. Those circuits are extremely complex we know some deep, you know, we know some things. So there are some ways in which I think neuroscience has a role to play right now. But I think uh, we ought to be very cautious, as I've been trying to say, in jumping to the conclusion that we know what the violent brain looks like, or we. I mean, that's what that's what the prefrontal lobotomy was about. So they just focus on the amygdala, uh, amongst other parts of that. Well, that was the psychosurgery as well. Their idea was, hey. We're just going to cut out the amygdala, or cut it up. I mean, that's a very simplified, oversimplified view. And I would say the same thing about saying, oh, it's just one gene, right? It's so um, I, I do think we need to be careful uh, about that. Uh, at the same time, I think there are some general findings we could take away that would, um, uh, that would in combination with behavioral evidence, you know, produce a more just and effective legal system. But I, I like the question and I agree we have to be careful. Thank you, sir. So the last question for uh, the session is uh, what a bias uh, is from Smriti Abhilasha who asks, what is the prospect of biomaker of deviant? Well, I think the prospect of biomarker of abnormality, which is different, so let me say that first, is very good of certain abnormalities. So the um, autism research I mentioned, that is gonna be live within the next few years. Why? For clinical purposes. So it should be live because we can help a bunch of children. The biomarker Alzheimer's disease work, that is already, that's basically here. And it's gonna be as simple as a blood test actually. Why? Because it can help hopefully find a cure for Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. Those are good things. So the biomarkers of abnormality will show up uh, again and again, and for a lot of other diseases and disorders too, not just those two. Whether or not that has legal relevance, so whether it is an indication of deviant behavior or some other form of legally relevant behavior, for instance, does an abnormal older brain mean that someone did not have the capacity or competence to sign their will? or to in, in, engage in a new contract or sell their home or sign their business or choose what their medical care is. Those questions are much more difficult. And ultimately those are gonna be questions that the law answers, not medicine and not neuroscience. And that's why I do a lot of the work I do because I think we have to make an informed choice in law. It would be easy if neuroscience said, oh yeah, here's the biomarker of capacity. Here's the biomarker of future violence. Here's the biomarker of this, but neuroscience will never do that. So we have to take all the information. We have to evaluate it. Like a lot of your questions are saying, like, is it good science or not? How do we know? And by the way, how as law professors and law students and, and police officers, et cetera, we're not trained in neuroscience. So how are we gonna know? And I guess I just say this at the end, I think we're gonna know because we have to collaborate. So you know, all of my work is in collaboration, often large collaborations with neuroscientists, engineers, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, physicians, psychiatrists, et cetera. And I know you have a very large university setting, you know, context there too, and, and actually international work. And so my last project, you know, we have 
I think I don't know, eight different countries represented in four continents. So um, I think it's going to be a collaborative effort because neither law nor neuroscience nor medicine has the answer and we have to work together to try and try and figure it out. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Matt. Indeed grateful. We're indeed grateful for your uh, uh, patient uh, addressing of our questions. Yes. Uh, we will move forward to the next uh, speaker. Uh, I would now request uh, Mr. Shmita Priyadarshini Mishra to introduce us to our next honorable speaker. Uh, good morning to my respected faculty member, guest of honor and fellow student. I am Sushmita Priyadarshini Mishra from LLM batch of 2020 and 2021. I'm delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Priyanka Kakir for the second international web webinar organized by Center for Criminology, Victimology and Police Science on Law, Brain and Mind Sciences. Dr. Priyanka Kakir is Senior Assistant Professor at the School of Behavioral Science of National Forensic Sciences University, Gandhinagar since 2013. She has been teaching and carrying out research in neuropsychology and forensic psychology. Currently, Madam, uh, Madam's ongoing research has been funded by ICSSR on developing a neuro signature system based profile of victims of domestic violence. Um, Madam is a member of core committee of juvenile justice rules of Gujarat government, which is currently engaged in a developing preliminary assessment module. Professor has 83 research and other presentation in national and international conferences and 70 research publication in above interested area. Apart from this, Madam is also a member of Editorial Board of International jo Journal of Indian Psychology and International Journal for Transformation of Consciousness. Professor is also an associate chief, ed uh, chief editor of newly launched journal called GAP Indian Journal of Forensic Liberals. All are training to personal judges, advocates, scientific officers, of national and international departments, laboratories, Institute of Forensic and Neuropsychology at Gujarat Forensic Sciences University. Madam has also handled anti-corruption cases, interrogation at IBS, GFSU, and is a government of India registered counselor. Apart from all this, she has achieved a lot of awards and recognitions. Few of them are recently in 2020, she has received a global faculty award by AKS Foundation Awards in April 2021. She has also received the Best Young Faculty Award at International Forensic Science and Criminal Investigation Summit and Award in 2020. Apart from this, she has also received Bharat Vikas Award in 2019 by Forensic and Cyber Science of, by the Institute of Sense, uh, Self Reliance at National Seminar on Vision 3E. We are honored and privileged to have Dr. Priyanka Kakir in our webinar to enlighten us with the deliberation on jurisprudence psychology, bridging the gap between psychology and law. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Sushmita. Uh, am I uh, audible and whether my screen is visible or not? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So thank you for a very nice introduction and thank you for inviting me for a very uh, important uh, area, which is very much required in today's uh, Corona period. And that is jurisprudence psychology. Uh, I would like to uh, bridge the gap between psychology and law through my uh, current talk. Uh, however, jurisprudence and psychology are uh, very well working in India and in abroad also, but uh, I will be focusing more on Indian concept and how uh, law and psychology are uh, closely attached, associated and working together in Indian setup and where the gaps are there and how to fill up that those gaps through collaborative research work and through collaborative understanding and awareness about both the jurisprudence and the psychology. 
so however jurisprudence and psychology are two separate disciplines but they have many things in common um based upon what law and psychology the areas where we both can work together and we are already working together are the eyewitness testimony the psychological assessment of suspects uh in order to find out whether the suspect or the offender or the victim is competent enough to stand trial uh if there is fitness to plead then how to assess that whether the person has competency to take criminal responsibility whether the person is mentally ill and he or she cannot take that responsibility to predict violent behavior sentence mitigation various type of forensic psychological investigation and lastly which is the most important aspect which uh, all lawyers are using it for uh, their cases is writing and presenting forensic reports in court as expert witness so as lawyers you are um, asking us questions as an expert witness and for which we have to justify the reports presented prepared and presented by us through the forensic investigation techniques and various psychological assessments that we have done in forensic labs there are many such questions which cannot be answered through forensic science or any other evidence presentation whether it is physical medical or any other evidence presented at court the questions are how to find out whether the victim or the eyewitness statement is correct and its false allegations for example in corruption dowry cases especially in dowry case whether the case is actually fake or real case so whether the person has actually underwent uh, harassment as part of uh, demand of dowry or it is just the fake case filed by the uh, girl's party also the suspect statement is correct that he has confessed many at times uh, in india people come forward and they confess their uh mistake or their crime but whether that confession is actually a genuine confession or it was done under pressure or if the person has denied the crime so a person who has actually committed crime but he is denying that he has committed that crime so how to answer all these questions for that forensic experts from psychology can be a great of great help and in order to answer those questions to detect uh, deception we use forensic psychological investigation techniques the process is very systematic and very standard uh, we go by what court has permitted us and what court has asked us to present so it is court's permission with which we start the investigation process so the subject or the suspect or the offender who is brought to the forensic lab comes with the court's permission to uh, administer certain forensic investigation techniques so it is the court who orders us to conduct administer polygraph polygraph in combination with narcoanalysis polygraph in combination with bios brain electrical oscillation signature profiling so it is the court with uh, court's understanding about the entire case uh we are conducting forensic investigation technique and before that the subject who will undergo the forensic investigation technique has already given his consent so the first consent is given to the court itself so uh, the question that arises about the uh, the right to remain silent if the person has given consent to speak about his case that means he is giving consent and that is not going against his rights after court's permission we do the forensic interview at forensic lab we have separate uh, standard operating procedure for conducting forensic interview also then we do forensic psychological assessment to find out whether the person is actually mentally sta uh, mentally stable or not and whether there is any fakeness in the mental instability or not so if the person has asked for uh, fitness to uh, Uh, plead if uh, he is that he is not mentally stable then that can be checked through forensic psychological assessment at forensic lab then we give the uh, detailed introduction about the tool that we are going to use on the subject 
so it is not like that the person will start uh, undergoing recording without having any understanding about the investigation technique he is undergoing so if we are going to conduct polygraphs we tell about the polygraph procedure to the subject of course we will not tell the questions that will be asked in the polygraph process otherwise the response will get manipulated but how it is going to be conducted whether it is non visit technique in visit technique so all the basic idea about the instrument is being provided to the subject after that we take consent second time so after the person knows about the entire procedure the consent is taken by the forensic psychological expert in the forensic lab there if the subject denies we cannot pressurize the person to undergo any sort of psychological investigation technique so again we are protecting human right and right to remain silent and once the subject has given consent then only the subject is brought for recording under the investigation technique asked by the court and after doing the recording the report is being prepared by the forensic psychology expert and it is submitted directly to the court uh, officially who is our the client so our client is actually the court and not the subject on whom we are doing the recording so the the report is not submitted to the subject the so called suspect or the offender underwent the forensic psychological investigation technique there are numerous techniques that we are using in india and uh, the most common technique which is known to uh, every forensic expert every professional involved in uh, judiciary is polygraph lead voice analysis suspect detection system is something which is very new and limited uh, uh, use narco analysis is known to almost everyone but then that is the only invasive technique in forensic psychological investigation apart from narco analysis other investigation techniques are non invasive in nature brain electrical oscillation signature profiling about which uh, dr francis has al also talked is the technique uh, which has been used from past 10 to 12 years and it is a well established technique in india and more than 400 cases has underwent bios uh, recording and the reports are presented as collaborative evidence in indian court and many cases has been taken uh, has been given judgment based upon the bios report micro expression is an upcoming technique which we are using on uh, anti corruption cases and uh, banking sector so in order to detect crimes in uh, banking sector we are now um, in process of uh, using micro expressions it is still uh, it will still take some time to come up as a uh, corroborative evidence in the court so as i said that there is a sop for conducting forensic interview so we have a audio video uh, room for for conducting forensic interview which is divided into two sections first section is the interview room itself where the subject and the investigator the forensic investigator sit face to face and in other room which is known as observation room where the forensic psychology expert sits and uh, administers the recording of the entire forensic interview so there we not only uh, ask questions but also guide the interviewer to ask certain questions if he misses certain questions uh, asking certain questions during his interview and the entire recording is being uh, recorded and submitted to court especially in case of anti corruption so in uh, anti corruption uh, cases we are uh, uh, following this procedure from uh, december 2017 and whichever case is coming to our university that case has been recorded and converted into a cd which has been submitted to court for for the investigation and this has helped us to do the lva layered voice analysis for better identification of the uh, recording uh, we got uh, for the investigation of anti corruption cases and uh, during covid we did one more research work where we tried to use lva with social distancing and it was found very effective so in covid situation if 
uh, such cases cases has been brought where we cannot go for in depth forensic psychological investigation. There, in that case, layered voice analysis can be used for screening of deception. Now, uh, these are the things which are going on in forensic as well as in law from past many years, not only in India but also in abroad. But uh, looking at the present condition and the gaps between psychology and law, these are the points which I feel that on which we have to work together in team as collaborative teams. And we need to find out some answers, some conclusion to all these issues. The first two gaps are the awareness and understanding. Are we aware about the crimes that are happening? the reasons behind those crimes and whether we have proper understanding about the investigation techniques that we are using from past so many years and court is also giving judgment based upon those investigation techniques. So as a lawyer, do you have an awareness and understanding about all these techniques, the causal factor, the neuropsychology of crime? Uh, as uh, Dr. Francis has already explained the neuroscience behind a criminal act. So there is a psychology also working with uh, one of the major factors which we have already discussed in the, the last session taken by... Am I audible? Okay. Yes, uh, by Dr. Francis. Yes, so brain dysfunction is also one of the factors that is leading to criminal behavior. And apart from that, there are some psychological disorders like conduct disorder in children and antisocial personality disorders in adults. Those are leading to crime, aggression, and criminal behavior in childhood uh, as part of conduct disorder and in adults uh, due to antisocial personality disorder. So we need to have an understanding and clear picture about the neuropsychology, how it is affecting the brain and why a person is committing crime. Uh, for example, we all feel aggression at some or the other point, but we don't get into uh, crime-based activity because of that aggression. So what is that that is controlling us? It's the brain, it's the frontal lobe that is helping us to deal with the inhibition and disinhibition of our body. Uh, I would like to say that the brain is responsible for the action committed by an individual. And if your brain is not responding properly, the person is indulging into criminal act. All the executive functions are led by neuropsychology and neuroscience. So it is related entirely to your brain. So if your brain is not trained properly, the person can get into criminal activity or criminal behavior. Now, since today we are talking about mens rea, and I totally understand and totally agree that in law you need to present mens rea. Now, as for William Glazer, there is a theory given by him which says that criminal act may be rational choice in a given situation for many offenders. See, it is a rational choice based upon which the person has committed crime. However, after commitment of crime, the person realizes that something wrong has happened and then he gives excuses that I was not under my mental control, I was not aware what I am doing, I don't know what, what I have done. But at the time of commitment of crime, the person has taken that action with rational choice. For example, right now you all are attending this lecture, that is your rational choice. Right? Nobody has forced you to join the link and attend the lecture. You are attending it with your brain involved, without your brain involved. I mean, with your attention, without your attention, but then it is your rational choice. And after that, you justify your behavior that why you were not able to pay attention. That's the separate or the secondary aspect of your action. So whenever a case is involved, there is always a mens rea. And for that, we need to understand the psychological reason of commitment of that crime. And for that, we need to work together. So whenever a case is presented to you and you are unable to get the mens rea, 
we forensic experts, we forensic psychologists can help you in finding out the menstrual. Now there is another theory called involuntary control over response. It was done by uh, uh, Professor Mukundan in 1986 and it is known as Breitschaft's potential where the research was done on two different groups. One was normal and another one, one was alcoholics. So a button was given to all the subjects one by one and the subject were instructed to press the button whenever they feel like pressing the button. So when the subject pressed the button, this is the point where the subject pressed the button and then the brain has responded. So this is the EEG, the EEG of normal individual and EEG of alcoholics. So when a normal individual press the brain, the, there is a certain drop of EEG activity. But it was seen that before a person has responded, the brain has already started initiating the response about which the person is not aware. So the awareness is at zero second, but the, the initiation of activity has already started at minus four or minus three seconds before the person has realized that he has to press the button. So in most of the cases, crime related cases the person realizes after committing crime that the, he has committed something which is morally incorrect and this happens uh, more in alcoholic patients so if a person is under the uh, uh, substance abuse or alcohol consumption in that case such involuntary control of response are predominant and because of which the, the, the chances of person getting into criminal act becomes higher. Uh, now, uh, polygraph, which is based upon the physiological responses has many uh, limitations and many critics that it is not effective and it cannot be used as collaborative evidence in court. Uh, it is uh, torturous in nature. Uh, how can you administer and how it can uh, give you 100% answer whether the person has committed crime or not. Uh, we need to understand this also, that there is no such instrument available up till now which can detect lies or truth. Polygraph is used to detect deception. Deception in terms of whether the person is possessing an information and he is not revealing it. Now, not revealing an information doesn't mean that the person is guilty. Okay. For example, I have certain information about my field, but when I am undergoing polygraph, I am not ready to reveal those secrets. So that doesn't mean I have committed any particular crime. So that understanding we need to have when we are using polygraph and it is based upon the physiological responses. However, it is only 70 uh, six percent accurate so we are not using polygraph as a single investigation technique it is always combined with other forensic psychological investigation techniques so that if a person is showing deception then further testing can be done in order to find out whether the deception is because of his involvement in the crime or there is some other issue uh, polygraph investigation has given many, uh, uh, what we say, uh, many conclusion based on which we can discriminate between a person who is holding an information and who is totally uh, innocent and has no information about the crime scene. For example, this particular case uh, in which four suspects underwent polygraph testing, it was found that out of four suspects, only A and B were trying to hide the truth. And in that also, A had a fight with B, uh, with the, the victim regarding property matters and B helped him in the crime. So there are two aspects, one who had a fight, another one who has just helped the person. So the involvement, how the involvement is done, that also matters when you are talking about judgment and related process. Now here, A denied the conflict, but under polygraph testing, it was found that he is trying to hide the information. And the other two suspects out of four, the C and D, 
were telling the truth and they did not show any sort of deception in the polygraph testing. But polygraph, which was extensively used in Indian setup, uh, got a twisting uh, turn in the uh, year 2010 after Selvi case. So that was a historical case for forensic psychological investigation, especially for polygraph. The case has raised three major concerns. One is consent. Second, right to remain silent. And you cannot torture a person to extract information from an individual. Fine. I have already answered about the consent, that the consent is taken twice. So we are not going uh, doing anything against the consent of the subject, irrespective of whether the person is guilty or innocent. Second is right to remain silent. In polygraph, we are asking questions in terms of yes and no, and the person is responding. So there the person is responding. So there it is not able to follow right to remain silent. But when it comes to torturesome, it is not at all torturous for any subject. Um, now there is a shift of paradigm. After 2010 Selby's case, there was introduction of brain electrical oscillation signature profiling, which measures the experience of an individual. It doesn't measure truth or lie. It measures whether the person has participated in the criminal act as a witness, as a victim, as a perpetrator. So these three differentiations can be done using BIOS poly, uh, profiling. Because the person who has witnessed have different type of experience. The person who has underwent as a uh, victim of a crime, the experience would be different. And the person who has uh, committed the crime, the offender, even that offender can be divided into three different sections. One, the conspirer. Second, person who has committed it and third the person who has asked him to commit the crime so there are different layers when we are investigation a particular crime and all those discrimination and distinction can be done if we are going on uh, your profiling in combination with polygraph so polygraph will give us an information or an understanding whether the person is possessing any information or not and if he is possessing an information, what type of information the person has that we can detect using BIOS profiling. Now, the question which was arised uh, uh, due to Selvi case, right to remain silent, that we are able to maintain in BIOS system. Here, we are not asking any question to the subject. And in return, the person is not responding to us in any manner. We present certain probes given by the statement by the subject and by the investigation officer. And based upon those statements, we prepare probes. Probes are simple statements like, my name is Dr. Priyanka. I work as assistant professor at National Forensic Sciences University. I presented a lecture in a, a webinar on this particular date. So you can see that there is no question asked. And since there is no question asked, so you are not responding anything in terms of yes, no, nodding of head, nothing. But your brain is responding automatically to all those probes. So you have all rights to remain silent and you have all rights to make your brain remain silent. But still, the system is able to catch the brain activity when a probe is presented and the brain is responding to that probe. For example, if I ask you to imagine a peacock and I ask you not to imagine a peacock, in both the conditions, you are able to imagine the peacock, right? Uh, just try and not to imagine a peacock. Please try not to imagine a peacock. But the more I'm forcing you not to try and try to imagine a peacock and more you are forcing yourself not to try and imagine a peacock, your brain is imagining it because you have seen the peacock. Similarly, in crime investigation also, if the person has committed crime and if he has participated in any manner in the criminal act, 
the brain will automatically respond to those strokes. And that is being recorded by the system and the report is generated automatically. About the torturous, torturesome or torturous nature of all these systems, I don't think it is torturous because all the systems are non-invasive in nature. And it is a matter of life and death. If health is a matter of life and death and a child can undergo EEG recording, sleep study, a person can be attached with so many equipments for saving his own life. An uh, elderly person can be attached with all these equipments for understanding his brain, whether he is uh, suffering with dementia or not. Then in that case, forensic psychological investigation techniques are also helping a person to save his life. So in that case, it is not torturous. And we all can undergo such technique because it is non-invasive in nature. It has no side effect on the person's body as well as on his brain. Now, cases like murder, uh, kidnapping underwent BIOS testing. And as I said, that more than 500 cases has underwent BIOS. And people are asking for researches on BIOS. So we have conducted few researches. Um, Cybercrime is one of the major concern nowadays because whenever a case is presented regarding cybercrime, what are the evidences presented uh, as part of the cybercrime case? The, those are the technological based evidences like presence of IP address, use of a particular system, uh, the system belonging to a person. And because of that, you have brought that person as a suspect for that particular cybercrime. Now the person is saying that uh, maybe my IP address is coming, maybe my system is misused, but I have not done that crime. Or my system is hacked. In such condition, how to do the investigation or how to give justice to the suspect. So in that case, BIOS can be helpful where we studied professional hackers and those who are non-hackers. And we did BIOS testing to, to discriminate whether the professional hackers can be uh, investigated using cybercrime, uh, using BIOS profiling or not. Similarly, the cold cases, cases which happened long back, can we retrieve those information in today's time? So suppose a person has committed crime 10 years back and now, especially in India, where the, the case is going on for 10 years, 15 years, irrespective of what type of case is going on. So in that case, whether a person can retrieve that information clearly in present condition or not. So for that also, we did a research work using BIOS and it was very well uh, articulated that a person who is having a memory of crime, which he has committed 10 years back, he can still remember it and can give better response on BIOS as compared to the latest or new event that he has underwent. So it doesn't matter whether the memory is recent or um, old, a person can remember it very well. Uh, however, in terms of explaining it, he might not remember, but the brain has uh, memory uh, intact and that can be retrieved or that can be uh, measured through BIOS. Now in Indian setup, what is happening is, even if the person has not committed crime, the person is probed with certain information in police station, in jail, in court. So all sorts of information is given to the subject, even if the subject is innocent. Now, in that case, if you do polygraph, then the polygraph will be somewhat uh, non-conclusive or it will show a, a divert, uh, diverse uh, result that the person is uh, innocent, but he is showing some information because he has gathered that information, the process he has underwent for the trials. But in BIOS, if the person has gathered information through listening to certain people and he has not committed crime, in that case, uh, we can uh, very clearly distinguish between the person who possesses the information and the person who has actually committed the crime. So that also can be distinguish using BIOS. And there are numerous researches that we have done. But the important thing is, 
on whom we can do forensic investigation technique now it is practice that you always uh, do forensic investigation technique on the so called offender perpetrator or the suspect now the chances are there am i audible my internet is showing instability okay yes ma'am uh, so okay fine thank you so uh, offenders are undergoing forensic investigation technique and if the person has really committed the crime we cannot expect truth from his side and in uh, such condition when the cases of domestic violence rape or sexual assault or uh, sexual harassment is present in front of court it is very difficult to justify whether the person has actually underwent uh any sort of uh, um uh, crime offense or not so in that case uh i am doing a research work which is uh, sponsored by icssr uh which will be done on victims victims of domestic violence now it is very easy to prove physical violence because you can present medical court uh, medical uh, reports medical certificate but what about verbal psychological and emotional violence how to prove that so uh, in our research we are able to distinguish between whether the person has underwent physical violence uh, psychological violence or verbal violence and this was one of the case of domestic violence victim who has given consent to undergo bios testing and we could find out that yes not only physical violence she has also underwent mental abuse which can be detected through bios system very clearly so we are still under uh, the completion of research project and once that is done i can come up with the final conclusion but this is what we can uh, uh, do to bridge the gap between law and psychology so numerous researches has been already done you can uh, find it out on uh, google now understanding uh, from the lawyer's perspective are you aware about all the psychological investigation techniques where to use this psychological investigation techniques which technique can be used in which type of case on which type of eyewitness or victims or suspects because lawyers uh, i will not say lack complete understanding but they do lack uh, information about certain uh, investigation techniques and how to use it and a research work was done on high court lawyers of gujarat which clearly stated that they have they don't have a clear structure of information when it, when we uh, try to un, uh, get information about polygraph narco analysis and especially bios they they loosely term bios as brain mapping bios is not brain mapping it's brain electrical oscillation signature profiling it is not a brain mapping instrument it cannot map brain activity um whether these tools are violating the article 21 or not as i have already explained that none of these tools are violating article 21 and especially uh, right to remain silent in order to make all these things clear and smooth we need jurisprudence psychologists at courts there are various legal aid clinic running at different states of india but how many legal aid clinics are actually providing proper legal aid to clients and how many clients are visiting these clinics and what is happening after they visit the clinic case is filed case is pretty case that two uh, people are fighting which can be resolved out of the court but then it is since it is filed now it is an ego issue and now it has to be fought in court so if we can keep a psychologist in legal aid clinic many problems can be resolved there itself and the number of cases will get automatically re reduced in terms of fir and court cases jurisprudence psychologists are required at every court right now court is allowing psychologists for marital counseling but what about victims of rape who are visiting court almost every week every month every day 
and they are undergoing same type of questions, same types of procedure again and again. So what is happening to their psychological well-being, mental health, and what is happening to the mental health of the family associated with them? Cases of domestic violence also require a psychologist to take care of their mental health. And for that, we need a collaborative research work between the jurisprudence and psychology or lawyers and psychologists. Mental health assessment. I am suggesting that mental health assessment is required for all the clients, all the victims, and all the eyewitnesses. Now, applicant who is filing multiple applications, his uh, job is to file applications, nothing else. He doesn't have any personal complaint. He is having some uh, social complaint and because of which he is filing PIL or any complaint in the uh, police station. So for that, we need an assessment, mental assessment of that particular complainant, whether he is mentally stable and whether his complaint can be taken in a proper manner or not the suspect and the offender victim victim whether the case is fake or genuine eyewitnesses juveniles juveniles uh, psychological assessment is must divorce cases why a person is taking divorce uh, the file of case is because the male is mentally ill and because of which the person is into domestic violence or there is some other issue if it is stress, then for stress management training program can be provided so that both of them can start dealing with their stress issue. Child custody. And especially the dementia aspect also require the assessment, especially in case of eyewitnesses, whether they are really suffering with amnesia, the suspect, whether they are really su suffering with amnesia and because of that, they are unable to recall the entire incident or uh, it is the fake amnesia shown by the offender. There are numerous assessments which can be used by the psychologist and which can help the lawyers in understanding the mental health and psychological uh, uh, stability of the suspect, the victim, the eyewitness, the offender, anyone. And for that, we can work in collaboration in order to understand whether the sexual offender is uh, uh, having a risk of committing the same offense again, or he can uh, get uh, rid of the uh, the court procedures through bail or parole, etc. So, dangerous prediction decision tree. It can be used on juveniles, spousal assault risk. So, it can be used on domestic violence cases, divorce cases. So you can, if you have understanding of all the psychological assessment, you can ask your client to go through or you can ask the opposition party uh, people, person to undergo this assessment so that you can fight your case in a better manner. Very extensive and collaborative research uh, need to be done by both the parties, psychologists and lawyers to study the personality of jurors, whether their personality fit for a particular case and whether they can deal with the judgment aspect procedures of that particular case or not. In-depth understanding of mens rea that I have already explained. Neuropsychology of crime. You should also understand the neuropsychology of crime, why the person has committed the crime. Is It is the brain dysfunction or it is because of disinhibition and because of which the person is unable to control his behavior. What are the psychological effects of trials? A case is going on, whether it is civil case, criminal case, for years together. So a healthy person can get into mental disturbance. So that assessment need to be done. Effect of punishments and judgment. Now, the question is why we are uh, giving judgment. It is only to punish the person because he has been found guilty for a particular crime. Or we want that person to get rehabilitated in the community. Or we want that person to become good and shall not repeat that behavior in future. So our concern is to give judgment so that the person can cannot get indulged into further criminal act. But 
frankly speaking, and it is very unfortunate that whatever judgment we are giving, uh, the court is giving, uh, is only a punishment. And that punishment is not leading that offender anywhere. And it is not helping that offender to get rid of the misbehavior, the criminal action shown by him or her. Also, the effect and success of parole in prisoners. Uh, prisoners are going on parole, but then is that helping them? Or are they running away from the, uh, because of that parole? They run away from that uh, area. So all these things need to be understood and researched. As well as there are future forensic psychological investigation techniques, which lawyers can also do a research on. For example, the devices like eye tracking, micro expressions. So when you are conducting interview, in order to find out whether your subject is uh, showing deception or not, you, are, you can use Microsoft, uh, micro expression software. There are social networking profiling softwares available. You can use that also to understand the, uh, the online terrorism or cybercrime related activity. The behavioral profiling, which is an upcoming technique in India, and it is artificial intelligence based, as well as statement analysis. However, statement analysis is done by forensic psychological experts, but you can also learn it and use it when you are taking statement from your clients. Training in counseling, forensic psychological investigation and report interpretation by the lawyers are required. So you need to get training and uh, as part of forensic psychology uh, university training program, we are providing training to police officers and lawyers. So there they are coming uh, with uh, broad mindedness and they are learning all these techniques. So the, on this we are already working, but a lot of work is still needed for the training purpose. Rajin's suggestions were given to uh, lawyers how they can uh, work with psychologists hand in hand. And he has given many suggestions like lawyers could become competent consumers of psychological products using the information in self-reflecting ways for decision making with their clients, whether to take the client, uh, how to assess them, how to understand them, how to make them understand that how they can give statement in the front of uh, the judge. So there are numerous uh, suggestions given by Drogin uh, where we can work together and contribute together in the field of law. Okay, so as I said that uh, criminal proceedings are done to give punishment. But if you go by psychology, reinforcement is always better than punishment. If you appreciate a person, you can win his heart quickly as compared to if you criticize the person. Now, the Indian Penal Code, which was developed in 1860, and Criminal Proceeding Procedure Code, CRPC, was developed in 1974. In 100 years, a new pandemic has been introduced. But in 100 years, we have not reconstituted or re-evaluated our IPC and CRPC. So big, huge amount of hard work is required to reconstitute our IPC as well as our CRPC. For example, there is one section in IPC, uh, sorry, CRPC, that security of good behavior in, and habitual offender. Now, what do you mean by good behavior in today's era? Uh, greeting someone is good behavior? No, it is part of mannerism. But there, 100 years before, greeting someone was considered as good behavior. So if a small gesture like this has changed so much, think about the laws for women's safety. Elderly abuse. There was a time when elderly people used to abuse their newly uh, uh, in-laws, uh, daughter-in-law. But now the daughter-in-law is abusing their in-laws. So now this, the situation is just reverse. Education, the education policies, the right to uh, get education. Is there any law if a person is paying uh, lakhs of rupees and in return he is not getting proper education? Is there any law? 
is there any law which can be implemented against the university or against the college or against the school human uh, employees rights and safety you think about corona period this pandemic period where are the human uh, human rights related to employees rights and their safety uh, in bengal election people were asked to do election duty because they have to do it and they they lost their lives because of election duty so is there any law is there any provision to provide them any benefit or whether they can suit any file against the against the person who has asked that person to do go for the election duty laws for good governance in 1970 in uh, 1860 when it was developed it was developed by britishers and they will not think about good governance they will think about giving punishment if the laws are not being followed now we are in a democratic country so if government is also not providing us good governance then there has to be law if they are not able to provide what we deserve then they shall be they shall be punished so there need to be laws for so many aspects technology and cyber crimes ipr intellectual property right you are you can use my uh, recording anywhere after that after, since you have done this recording you, now you don't need me since you have done francis's recording so now you don't need his lecture once again you can repeat this recording and uh, people will understand what is neuroscience and what is forensic psychology but then that is against the law that is against the proper uh, intellectual property right what about stalking is there any law for cyber stalking is there any law for cyber terrorism hacking identity theft on facebook people are using each other's identity he is behaving as she she is behaving as he and they are indulging into uh, relationships what are the laws against it and that is why the crime is increasing because there is no such uh, proper law to stop all these things or there is no such punishment disaster management suicide euthanasia uh, there are people suffering with cancer who want to end up their uh, lives are you thinking about those laws mental health and illness is there any law for mental health and illness there are acts and i will not say that uh, uh, government has not uh, implemented any law there were several amendments at several times you can see the list but and there with the help of forensic psychology experts you can prepare laws as we did in juvenile justice act there we prepared laws rules and regulations guidelines for all these also we can join hands in hand and we can prepare laws amendments guidelines rules and regulations is there any provision for security of victims and their family members we are only focusing on the offender to give punishment to the offender what is happening to the victim in return what the victim is getting just uh, a satisfaction that the offender has got punishment i think that is not a equal justice given to the victim and the offender law and related punishment for filing fake cases if a person has filed fake cases can any action be taken against those people applicants fake eye witnesses in india it is very common false complaints benefits of human rights to victims and family members we always talk about benefits of human rights for the offender it's the human right to right to remain silent but what about the human right that he has broken by creating a victim by doing an offense and lastly ethics for professional involved in judicial cases especially for media professionals print and digital both for example in shushant's case whether it was suicide or murder media has hyped that case tremendously and on social media people were like they all were forensic expert and they all were giving their opinion that it was a suicide it was not a suicide it was murder and why it is a murder case think about their family members who has just lost their young son who are unable to cope up with their loss and the media is presenting his son's photographs his son's uh, private life on uh, national channel they are 
uh, getting all this information and it is repeating in front of them again and again. So it is torturesome for the person who has lost his young son. Arushi murder case. We all know what has happened and what are the evidences for Arushi murder case. Pandemic coverage. It is always a negative coverage. There is no positive news information given by the media. And then the media blames that we are criticizing them. So is there any law to protect such evidences, such information? Police person is providing such information to media. Is there any code of conduct ethics for police uh, personnel? NGOs are providing certain information. So there has to be ethics for professionals whosoever is involved in judicial cases. And formation of special courts are required. Though family courts are there, but then uh, any case related to mental illness, women victims and juveniles. Juvenile court is also there, but then what is happening in that court, lawyers are not interested in fighting the case. They are getting their salary because they are being nominated, nominated by the magistrate to take care of a particular juvenile case. They think that they are getting salary and they... Uh, explain the same thing to the child also that after three years or after two years when once you are 18 years of age you will out of uh, juvenile home so don't no need to worry just enjoy your life so both the parties are not willing to fight their case and because of that when if there is chance of a juvenile to get a proper environment to become a proper individual a civilized in individual that that period is lost because the person has um, been present, imprisoned in observational home where he is interacting with hardcore criminals. So in that case, we have to have uh, understanding and we need to fill up, bridge all these gaps together without which the crime and uh, the related aspects cannot be dealt in India. In today's world, after this pandemic, we need three professionals, healthcare professionals, lawyers, and psychologists. These are the three professionals which we need after pandemic. So if three of us can work together, we can resolve the medical health issue, we can resolve the, the increase of crime, and we can resolve the increase of case because of the crime that is happening during after pandemic. So stay healthy, safe and secure. And if you have any questions, I am ready to answer. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for such an engaging discussion. Uh, now I would like uh, request uh, Dr. Devina Majumdar, Assistant Professor, Kids School of Law and Member CCVPS to kindly initiate the discussion on the questions. Thank you so much, Manisha ma'am. Thank you, Priyanka ma'am, for such a beautiful presentation. So I would request the participants to post their questions in the chat box. Now the floor is open for discussion. No questions are asked, meaning nobody has understood what I have spoken. I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, my uh, question is, uh, ma'am, can you uh, throw some light on this uh, layered voice analysis and its process? Layered voice analysis uh, measures the voice quality uh, of an individual when there are two ways one is online and another one is offline so suppose when i am speaking whether any there is any deception in my speech or not after a question is asked and there are offline measures where the recording is being analyzed using the system to find out the stress and to also to measure whether the two voices of the individual recorded in the system and the person who is speaking in front of you are similar or not. 
so for that for voice analysis we can use layered voice analysis and for that uh, consent is again required without consent you cannot do lva uh, and micro expression technology uh, ma'am can you throw some light on yes um, you all know what is uh, uh, body language right but anyone can manipulate body language so if a person is confident the person will talk freely and there will be a um, complete expression the whole body will uh, make certain gestures but it can be manipulated but the facial expressions especially the micro expressions cannot be manipulated so for example i am showing you fake smile this is my fake smile but if i am genuinely smiling then there will be a crease in my eye corner and the smile will also show certain crease which can be detected only through micro expression software not only that there are combination of um, uh, muscle changes which can be detected only through that software which cannot be detected through naked eyes so that expression which i am trying to manipulate can be detected through those micro expression software which cannot be uh, directly or voluntarily man manipulated by the subject when he is sitting for forensic investigation for forensic interview so ma'am is there any uh, science to uh, substantiate the claim that uh, if a person is faking uh, faking a smile then uh, uh, her uh, or his uh, what you stated that uh, above or around the eye some kind of crease will be there is there any scientific uh, study uh, paul ekman has done a uh, lot of research work on micro expressions mm -hmm. and it is not only the uh, it is not only one uh, feature that is being detected by the software there are combination of features in microsecond the the suppose it is a one minute uh, video then that video will be divided into fraction of seconds and for each fraction of second what your micro expressions are showing that is being detected by the system mm, uh, i understand but uh, can you throw some light and how when, uh, when the expression comes you observe that particular phenomena or the event but uh, the inference that this observation is relating to a fake uh, uh, the value that we put that it is a kind of fake or it is true how that value is put uh, the inference okay. from the event how the, the uh, inference is done can you through so when a question is asked and the person is responding to that question there are facial expressions uh, seen for that particular question now for example a question is asked which is surprising for me that oh he knows this uh, information so that surprise can be seen on my face now that surprise can be seen through eyebrow raise by the widening of pupil and some uh, change in expression or give you a response on that software using that you can find out whether it is surprised deceptive um, uh, uh, question mark or the person is little bit scared feared so there are different types of responses uh, where the expressions are combined in in different manners okay thank you we have a question from sushmita our student llm good morning how far india has implemented bears as a technological development and what is your opinion about how this technology will help in faster and quicker delivery of justice uh, india has been using bios from past uh, 10 more than 10 years it started in uh, 2006 the research was started in 2006 and after selvi case it was used in court uh, as corroborative evidence so you can imagine 2010 onwards uh the next is what is your opinion about how this technology will help in faster and quicker delivery of justice it can be quicker and faster only if we have broad mind to accept such technology based reports and if lawyers can use it on uh, in their cases 
as a positive investigation technique rather than finding out faults. Try to understand, get an answer from the scientists who are working on it. And if you are not, uh, not uh, uh, satisfied with the answer, then you reject the technology. So when I discussed uh, this technology with one of the Supreme Court lawyer, she said that you do it on uh, real victims, then only I will uh, accept the technology. So I said, okay, you send me the victims, you send me the offenders, I'll do it. So for that, you have to send us the subject so that we can do it and find out the truth, whether it is really helpful or not. Apart from that, what we are doing in, uh, in Gujarat is uh, we have already done a lot of research work and we have already published a lot of data based upon BIOS. And if you go by the real life cases, I, I have already mentioned that more than 500 cases has underwent BIOS from all over India. Initially, the, uh, the Gandhi Nagar Forensic Lab was the only lab where the BIOS system was uh, functional. But now uh, in uh, Bombay uh, FSL also, it has been functional. And there are other uh, states are now in procurement of the system so that they can also use it. Thank you, ma'am. There's another question from Mr. Atul Anand. Good morning, Priyanka, ma'am. I have completed my graduation and post-graduation in criminal law specialization. I wish to pursue my PhD in forensic psychology and criminal psychology. As far as I have researched, this is less addressed or less researched field in the law in law in India with limited amount of resources in the field. Will it be right for Atul to pursue his PhD on this field. He needs a guidance map. After doing PhD, if your uh, focus is to do further research work or to join academics, you are most welcome to do your PhD. Yes, you are 100% right that uh, there is less awareness about this particular field. And I am uh, very much thankful to KIIT University for bringing up this issue, this topic uh, for international webinar so that uh, everybody will understand what it is and how lawyers and psychologists can work together to understand crime and uh, the behavior associated with it. As far as uh, job prospects are there, uh, India is in process of opening various uh, forensic uh, universities uh, in each state of India, as well as uh, in each country across the globe. Uh, National Forensic Sciences University has got that uh, responsibility to open at least two campuses in India and one campus in abroad for uh, forensic for uh, imparting forensic uh, uh, science based uh, education. So if you are uh, interested in pursuing PhD in forensic psychology and criminal psychology, you have good uh, opportunity to become uh, a faculty, as well as once you become a faculty, you can get into research work also. Yes, we are in dearth of researchers, especially in this field. And so we need more number of uh, PhD students also. We have another question from Mr. Shavik Roy. What is your take on application of such technologies on judges or decision making bodies on an experimental basis, notwithstanding the other usages? Uh, you want to say that whether we can use these technologies on judges and whether uh, such uh, professionals have uh, proper decision-making skills or not. Is that your question is? I invite you to please yes. clarify. Yes, yes, okay. Sir, yes. Okay. Uh, you are going to hurt someone's ego. Uh, <laughs> The fully functional judges, we cannot target them to assess their mental health and their decision-making process. But yes, in order to make that process easier, when they are learning law, when they are undergoing such courses, so after that and before uh, taking them as, uh, recruiting them as judge or lawyers, we can do an assessment. So before recruitment, uh, such assessments can be done, whether they are really having that capability to become judge and whether they really have decision-making capability or not. But once they are into that uh, 
position after that we cannot touch them but judicial bias have had plagued nation since time immemorial yes and uh, that's why i have uh, included all the gaps in my today's lecture if we can focus on at least 50% of it i'm sure that we can uh, give justice to judiciary by becoming non biased thank you so much ma'am do we have any more questions okay so i invite mr siddharth shekhar das to please propose the vote of thanks uh we thank uh, dr am i audible okay. yes we, sir you are audible uh we thank dr sen for his wonderful lecture and discussion i'm sure the indian audience shall be immensely benefited from it it has he has been very cooperative with us in giving his time and very cooperative in organizing this webinar we thank dr sen and also wish him and his family good health in this challenging time we also thank dr priyanka for her kind cooperation in giving us her precious time out of her busy schedule she has been very cooperative with us we also thank dr priyanka for her and also wish her good health and to her family as well in this challenging time we thank our founder dr achuta samanta our pro vc ma'am dr Sam sasmita samanta our vc sir dr rishikesh mohanty our registrar and our director sir dr bhavani panda for their constant support for this program i also thank dr arpita mitra our center coordinator for her constant mentoring and also Ms. Manisha Devolina, Madam Sikha, for their constant support and graciously sharing times for the organization of this webinar. We also thank Sasmita and Smuti, student LLM, for their beautiful introduction and also sharing time despite their approaching exams. We also thank our scholars and students across India for their encouraging participation during this hard time. We also thank our colleagues. of school of law for their participation even during a sunday we thank santosh sir for his technical support for the program thank you everyone wishing you best of health during this covid period thank you one and all thank you for joining us today thank you uh, thank you us. everyone thank you everyone thank you thank you